All right. So I do have kind of a time constraint today of about four hours. Um, but there are a couple of things that I want to look into that are really hard problems. So first of all, let me... Uh, I don't think I have anything that I can't save and quit here. So I'm just going to do stream term. This will get us a font that's readable for you old people. Stream term. Okay, so we're going to go into soft serve, and we're looking at divergent stress test. And <laughs> you know it's not a good sign when we're in the divergent stress test folder. Um, <laughs> that means we have some bugs we need to work out. Uh, but that's, that's fun, I guess. Uh, we'll do deploy over here. It's just all going to... Everything's broken right now. So, I did a, a relatively big change yesterday in, okay, um, in vectorized emulation, which is a really, really hard problem. And let's go into folk L source mm, L session. Okay. This font might actually be pretty hard to work with today because I'm used to having like 10 files open at a time when I'm working on... Uh, on what I'm about to be working on. So, what I did yesterday is I took these lines of code and I commented them out. And, <laughs> and basically, these lines of code were the ones that were preventing vectorized simulation from actually doing vectorized simulation. Basically, if there was any divergence uh, between the VMs, it would shut everything down and kind of reset the VMs. It would basically turn off all the VMs. Obviously, with vector simulation, that's pointless, so um, so I need to support that. And so I've been looking into different ways I want to support it in this new, like, rewrite of vector simulation, because I haven't quite gotten this up and working. Um... The very first version of vectorized simulation that I did was block-based and not graph-based, which made these problems a lot easier. It also only followed VM0, so if anything diverged, it would follow VM0 and turn the other ones off. Whereas this version of vectorized simulation is a lot more complex and a lot more correct in that it will follow whichever VMs are running. So if all of them go off and diverge different paths, it'll follow one of them at a time come back to where the others left off and continue executing. Well, that's the goal. Um, unfortunately, there are some design decisions that I made that make that not necessarily the case. Um, and that's, that's going to be a really hard problem. So, uh, uncommenting this line was, uh, was a big problem. So Let's talk a little bit about vectorized emulation, what it is. I, I know a lot of people here probably are somewhat familiar, but I assume that at any given time, half the people here have never been here before. Um, so, I'm trying to think of the best way that I can graph this. I can draw it in GIMP, but when I pull up GIMP, I, have to, I draw some pretty shitty graphs. So that might not be the play. Um... I need like a, a fast prototyping graphing thing. I, I could maybe use like dot files, kind of, sort of, but I don't know. Let's uh, let's pull up a graph because we can. Uh, we'll we'll grab a, a Fuego Fox tab here. Home pleb uh, soft serve. That'll get us in the ballpark. Um, that's not exactly what I want. I'll do a cargo run release, update the graph. Well, that's quite the graph right there. Um, it, it, it does kind of stress what I'm interested in. So, what kind of graph? I, I don't, the problem is I don't really know. I want something that, like, works really dynamically. I think dot is probably the closest to what I want, because I'll, be talking about flow. Um, all right. But GIMP's easiest. So we're going to use GIMP. Uh, new. I don't know why it picked that as the background. 
Fancy stuff, Gimp. Okay. So, what? I guess, I guess control U opens the last thing, which was the cash out logo. <laughs> All right, uh, let's use this. Yeah, whatever. Okay, so we have, Factor Simulation is a really simple way of emulating, and by really simple, I mean basically the most complex way you can go about emulating. You know what, you can't draw boxes in GIMP, can you? There's no way to just draw a box, which kind of makes this useless. What about Inkscape? I swore I had it installed. Maybe I uninstalled it after I like didn't use it or something. Draw.io, let me check that out. That's an interesting. Draw.io. Flowchart maker. Save diagrams to Google Drive to device. Nice. Whoa. 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 Is this like Visio? Ah, this might be Nash. Wow. And it can. Okay. Wow. Wow. This might be perfect. And let me guess, I can just put text in here nice so this looks a lot like Google but I guess this is not actually by them pretty crazy and then control s will actually save the document wow is this free and open source uh, draw on, draw IO Linux So they said there's a desktop one, didn't they? Somewhere? I swore something said there's a desktop version. Or is it only online? G Suite desktop. Is it open source? JGraph. Linux. There's a Debian package. All right. I mean, this is literally just gonna be the uh, um, a Chrome thing. Apt install draw.io. Let's just see if it's in here. Draw.io. Draw-io. Nope. Let's grab this. Yeah, this is just gonna be a Chromium Electron app, but hey, if it gets me the version that works best and has better integration with saving locally, then I'm all for it. Uh, apt install home pleb download straw. Oh, this is gonna be nice, I think. Dude, this is sick. Dryo dash desktop. Is that is that is that a thing? Apt cache search draw yo. Um, it doesn't look like there's one, but we just install it from this package, so this will be fine. And I'm guessing this will probably be self-updating. Most most of these applications are, so now I should have a draw IO. Nice. Nice. And this will work locally now. Create, save. Nice. And I guess we'll go into soft serve and we'll make diagrams and vacuum. Nice. This is really cool. All right, so now I have this, which is nice. I mean, it's, cle it's clearly just a website, but it has better local file system support when you're running locally in this. The very last result, there's a draw IO. Really? Oh, I missed it then. Oh well. <laughs> okay, so let's. Uh, I gotta. I gotta learn this tool a little bit. This is management training right here. Ooh, advanced. Advanced. Okay, so I can make shapes. Oh. <laughs> oh. 
Oh, yeah. Oh, I'm in business now. Got an or gate, and gate. Is there really no XOR gate? Is there... Is is that under advanced? Is XOR advanced? Where is it? Oh, I can search, can I? XOR. Ah, there they are. <laughs> Ooh, that's kind of cool. Okay. You have to program your own XOR. Just make a bunch of NANDs. You only have an AND, though. I guess people don't really XOR in diagrams that aren't sch schematics. Some sort. Interesting. I'm just, I'm just looking to see what I have here. I got a smiley face. That's a really bad smiley face. Why is it that... I, I mean, I, I know why free art is always worse than like paid for app art. Because it's, it's free. Um... There's a more shapes thing. Oh, oh, what's Android? Wow, okay. iOS, mockups, that's close to what I want. Okay, so what I want is like array. Ah, uh, yes, you know what I really want? In my diagram, I specifically want a Sun Storage 2500-M2 array. <laughs> this is, this is, uh, is there vector array? Yeah, so let's see. Is there a way to search here? What I really want are arrays. I want... um. Basically, what I want is uh, this. I want something that I can tell it like four, and it makes like this, right? So there's a chance that I can have maybe splits in here. Part. Tree moving. Arrange. Otherwise, I'm just going to make one of these and, like, template it. Maybe I can make that. Maybe I can, like, group. And then... Mm, There's got to be a way that I can turn this into a shape, right? Right? Shapes. What's that? Oh, that's this. Drag to... Is it? Oh my! Ah! Oh! <laughs> That's so easy. <laughs> okay, nice. So that's now my in my scratch pad, which makes sense. Now, one thing that I do wish here is I wish the canvas was just infinite sized. I recognize custom. I just want it to just be infinite in size. We'll just do this. All right. So like, I just wish I could arbitrarily pan and I would just get more and more created as I use it. I don't know if that's a thing that I can do, but anyways. Okay, so I have the scratch pad. Oh yeah. And then I can do this. Oh, and that sizes because everything is vector, vector art, vector graphics. Okay. Now we're in business. <laughs> oh no, did that? Okay, there we go. Five. Dude, this is gonna be sick. The fonts are a little bit blurry here. Zoom, 100% zoom. Is there a way that I can zoom without it getting... Oh, there it's not aliasing. Let's see if the... Maybe I zoomed in the wrong spot. Like, this is a little bit blurry here. Maybe I can turn that off. I'm so picky about my editors. I, I hate anti-aliasing in a lot of these situations, except for fonts. It's good on fonts, but it's terrible on shapes. Because then you get these, like, fuzzy ed edges. I want it to be crisp. Um, nope. All right, that's probably not going to be an option. 
so zoom 100%. Okay. That means I want to change the font size here. Let's see if I can change the font size for all of this. Oh, I can just up the size of this to make it bolder. And then text will just set to like 24. Yeah, buddy. And uh, how do I remove these? Oh, that do it does expand if you just arbitrarily use it. Never mind. Okay, how do I how do I remove one of these? Okay, remove those. So this one is in. Is that visible on? I think that is. And then. Is this legible from 100% zoom? It looks like that is. <laughs> What's going on here? I'm learning how to use Draw.io. <laughs> We're a little bit derailed because I said I need to draw a diagram. Um, don't worry. This is going to be useful uh, when we start drawing diagrams. So this is just nice because it's open source and portable between all, uh, all the OSs that I use. So, okay. So we've got this, we'll group all those. So that should be everything in one big old group. Nice, and then we'll put it here, edit, and we'll name this uh, vector of four. Boom. <laughs> Looks like an interesting program. Yeah, it actually is pretty sweet. I'm a big fan of this. Did that remember my font decisions? It looks like it did. Uh, actually, we didn't we didn't pull it over here. We'll do this. Nice. Okay, so that's always going to be that. All right. Is it a web app or a local app? This is a web app if you just go to draw.io, but I downloaded the local app. Uh, it works on anything. It's just uh, it's an it's an Electron app. It's just a browser on desktop, but I downloaded it so it had better local file read and write capability. So, and it's also nice. I don't like working in a browser all the time, especially on stream, because then I don't want to have history showing up and stuff. So it's nice to have it to be just a completely separate app. Um, and then I have more confidence about the version and portability because it, I know it's a specific version. And if my diagrams for some reason get outdated, if they update the website, I know that locally I can just use the old version because I don't care. Anyways. So, what is vectorized emulation? Let's see. There was like an ad. There was a sum field. Right? Nice. So, vectorized emulation is, first of all, before I go too deep into it, let me, uh, I can pull up my blog. So, I've written about vectorized emulation a couple times now. Um, but effectively, it's an extremely high performance emulator. And the way that it works, uh, is relatively complex, but uh, we use the vector instructions. In this case, uh, nice, nice, and that's a good font. In this case, I'm using the uh, ZMM registers, but we're going to say XMM. Uh, actually, I'm going to say YMM because it's four technically right now. And you know what? I'm going to say ZMM just so it's like, even though it's less correct, it's more clear. So basically your processor has the ability to run uh, these SIMD instructions, these parallel instructions. So for example, one of these instructions is uh, VP add Q. And this stands for, it's very, it's very obvious, uh, this is vectored pack add quad words. Uh, let's see, ZMM0, ZMM0, ZMM1. We'll do this. Okay, so we're gonna draw out, basically, fuck it, let's go all the way to Z. So, this mnemonic, this instruction, so this is an instruction that runs directly in assembly or in bytecode or whatever you wanna call whatever runs on the processor. This instruction gets executed directly on your processor and it is v vector p packed add for adding things quad word q for quad word for 64 bit values and effectively what this is going to do is it's going to take 
the value in the values in ZMM0, add them to the values in ZMM1, and then output the result to ZMM0. So if we take a look, and we'll just do a little bit of clonage here. Okay, this application so far is looking really nice. It's really just like Visio. I do want to make that box a little bigger. And I think those are the same size. Yeah. Okay. So let's say ZMM0 had five, six, seven, eight, which for some reason is always what I use during these examples. <laughs> Dave, laugh my ass off. You call yourself a Gamozo fan? I'm fucking loaded on channel points, bro. I highlight every message because I'm just that jacked. Try talking in chat again when you're a true fan. <laughs> that was pretty good. I think that's the first, that might be the first meme-y, shitposty uh, chat message I have seen so far in my channel. <laughs> so can congrat congratulations. I aim to please, dude. Hell yeah. All right. So this instruction is going to add these. Now, this is different than a normal add instruction on x86 because this is going to perform this packed add of quad words, which is really interesting. So ZMM registers are 512 bits. They're part of the AVX 512 instruction set. Uh, which has 512 bits per register, which means eight different 64-bit variables. It looks like a tilted XOR. Yeah. Um, anyways, so we have these values. We're going to do this. And so AVX 512, these would technically be eight wide, but we're going to use four wide. I'm pretty sure for all of our examples, four wide is going to be plenty to demonstrate the problems and difficulties that I'm having, uh, and thus, we're just going to kind of ignore um, anything that's not that. So I think I was using 60. Yes, I was. And this is going to be an equals. Yeah, that's 60. That's 60. Okay. So then this instruction is going to produce an output. I, I'm so picky on alignment. Why did that get moved over there? What? Copy, paste. That is, I must have done something strange. So this is ZMM0, this is the output register, and this is going to take 5 and 1 and add them up to 6. 6 and 2, and we get 8. 7 and 3, and we get 10. 8 and 4, and we get 12. That was really testing my mental math skills. But this is the beauty in SIMD instructions, is with one x86 instruction, one vector packed add quad word, I know it looks like a mess, you're able to add eight 64-bit values together two times per cycle per core. So when I'm doing most of my work on the Xeon Phi, so let's go uh, stream term, SSH, Phi land. Uh, so the Xeon Phi has a lot of cores off the screen number of course. To be specific, this has 256 threads or 64 physical cores. And that means the theoretical performance of the Xeon Phi is the clock rate, which is uh, 1.3 gigahertz, but when you're doing AVX 512, it actually down clocks by 200 megahertz, so it runs at 1.1 gigahertz. So the Xeon Phi, you have 1.1 gigahertz, times 64 cores, phys 64 physical cores, times two operations per cycle, times eight operations per operation, eight ads per operation. So this is the number of uh, ads per, this is the number of, of tera ads or this is actually giga ads. So you can do 1.1 trillion additions per second with AVX 512 on this machine, which is a lot um, for a, a machine that's this cheap, to be honest. It's, it's pretty absurd. It's not GPU numbers, but it's a lot. And if you're doing 32-bit uh, values, now it's 2.2. And if you're doing 8-bit values, then you can do nine 
trillion operations per second. Um, anyway, so I want to leverage that capability when I'm doing emulation. So I typically will emulate stuff so I can find bugs and fuzz things. And to do that, uh, I want to emulate as fast as humanly possible. So I came up with this idea... Holy shit, I think it's been almost three years. It might be more than that. It might almost be four years that I've been doing this shit now. Um, but effectively, I, I had this idea, or more specifically, what I really wanted to do is I wanted to buy a Xeon Phi. And you might be wondering, why do you want to buy a Xeon Phi? Well, it's because I can run HTOP and I can look at this. Who doesn't want this? Can it run Crisis? Absolutely not. It would struggle. So this is something that I dreamed of owning. Um, and it honestly wasn't that expensive. So what I did is I bought it, and then it had like five days to ship to my place because I had to go through a supplier. It's not like standard hardware where you just buy it off Newegg. You kind of have to wait for... Uh, I had to like go through like a server vendor, and they would package it up and everything. So it was like five days until it came. So then I'm sitting there and I'm like, why the fuck did I just buy this machine? I don't know if I can justify this purchase that I just made. Um, so I had to think of what I could do. So at the time, my bread and butter was Fulkervisor. And Fulkervisor is a hypervisor that I wrote that I've open sourced some shitty versions of it. I mean, I've open sourced the really good versions of it. <laughs> uh... <laughs> Oops, github.com, Gamoza Labs. So, I've open sourced a, a few of them. Uh, Fulkervisor Guild Cheese and, and Fulkervisor Beta. And these actually were pretty close to what I was working on. I think I had a Rust version uh, by the time I was doing vectorized emulation. Because I don't think I ever wrote vectorized emulation in C. I think I only worked in Rust. Anyways, uh, my bread and butter at the time was using... Uh, the VTX extensions with a custom hypervisor to provide introspection and to fuzz the shit out of anything that I wanted to. Um, I probably had the highest performing fuzzers for system level fuzzing. Honestly, I could fuzz anything on x86 probably faster than anyone else could. Um, and I think that still holds to this day, which is really sad. Um, but... I had really uh, lightweight VMs, I had differential sharing between the VMs, I would only pull down parts of the VMs that were being used by the fuzz case, I would share all of the pages that were read-only between all the snapshot image images, I would gather uh, code coverage without having source, um, all these different things that give me a huge advantage. Basically, I could fuzz the Windows kernel faster than Microsoft could fuzz the Windows kernel. And... And that's also still true to this day, which is really fucking frustrating. Anyways. <laughs> so, that was my bread and butter at the time. But I just bought this beefy 64-core, 256-thread machine. Now, what am I going to do with this machine? Well, you would think I'd just use my, my hypervisor on here. Just port Fulkervisor to the Phi. That's really not too hard. It's pretty easy to port my operating system to any hardware. It takes, like, literally a day. Worst case scenario, you have some, like, weird edge cases with this many cores, and you have to, like, change some constants in your globals. Um, but there's a little bit of a problem with the Xeon Phi. And the problem with the Xeon Phi is it doesn't support VTX at all. And it's not that I didn't know that. I totally knew that going into it. So I bought, I bought a 256 thread machine uh, that could not run literally the best software that I had to find bugs. That was just leagues above what everyone else was using to search for bugs. But I'd, I bought this fancy new machine that didn't support VTX. So that kind of made it really difficult for me because I had to figure out what exactly I would justify this purchase by doing. And at the time, I was doing a, a decent handful of emulation. I, I, wrote, I wrote an ARM emulator and a MIPS emulator uh, for a couple like exotic targets I was looking at. And the MIPS emulator that I was running... Uh, I was actually just starting to get much better performance on that. So... 
I had just, just gotten my MIPS emulator to sub-cycle, so it could run one MIPS instruction in under one x86 cycle um, for a mixed payload. So, like, for an arbitrary firmware that I was fuzzing that was doing memory operations and I was at the whim of that application, I think I was running, like, uh, 0.7 cycles per MIPS instruction or something in that ballpark. So... The very first MIPS uh, emulator that I wrote uh, was basically... Huh, okay, now we're going down the emulation side of things and, and how I ended up in, in this position. But uh, I had Fulkervisor for a while. I wrote it in like 2013, 2014. So basically anything on AMD 64, uh, Intel 32-bit, 64-bit, 16-bit, don't give a shit. I can fuzz it as fast as your processor will allow me. I can, I can just burst through fuzz cases. Um, but this kind of was a problem when I was looking, I was doing a lot of Android research at the time, which is ARM. Uh, it wasn't really ARM64 yet. I was doing some random things with exotic targets that were running MIPS. Uh, and I had a mix of things that were big Indian MIPS and little Indian MIPS. I had a couple PPC targets that I wanted to look at. Uh, so I did what every security researcher person does, and I started using QMU. And anyone who has used QMU before, and has worked in the code base, and is critical about how software works, knows that QMU is pretty bad. I'm not saying... I'm not saying it doesn't have really good support for all this different hardware and it works on all these architectures. I can't argue with that. I cannot compete with the breadth of support that QMU has. And, and I'm grateful that there's a community there that does that work. But the, the code quality and the just working with QMU is miserable. It's bolted together with like go-tos and long jumps, and exceptions are really wonky. The memory management is put together by linked lists, which is incredibly slow. It's, it's like, really bad. And on top of that, uh, it also uses an IL, which is, which is fantastic if you care about perf, but if you care about being able to single step through things, or being able to, like, trace and figure out everything about how a program works, Having an aisle there actually kind of adds a layer of confusion where maybe you randomly break into the application that you're fuzzing and you want to see the state of things. And if the IL registers don't get flushed out correctly to their target registers, you're looking kind of at an invalid target register state. I know that if you use GDB, it's fine, but I can't, I can't automate GDB. So I have to hook into these things, and I have to be conscious of where things are getting cached in QMU, and I have to know whether or not I can go directly to the target register thing, or if I have to go to aisle registers and translate them to find the right register that they belong in, and it's just a mess. Um, and the QMU performance in system mode is pretty bad as well, especially due to that memory manager. So I wrote a custom memory manager for QMU that supported... Uh, like differential restores and fast snapshot restores. And I, I ended up with something that was pretty good where I'd be able to run like, I don't know, I think it was like a thousand fuzz cases a second or something like that in QMU on, on a single like laptop or something, which was okay. Um, and then I started to still kind of have issues with QMU. I had the perf kind of going pretty well. Uh, but working in QMU is a pain. QMU itself is really bloated. There's a lot of abstractions. It's kind of hard to know where everything goes in QMU. So then I decided to write an emulator. And at the time, I think, I think I'd already written an ARM emulator, and, and who cares? It's not that big of a deal. Uh, but at the time, I was focusing on a MIPS emulator. So I started working on a MIPS emulator, and it was not designed for performance at all, which is very unlike me, but this was one of the very few times in my life where performance was not the focus. What I wanted was clarity. What I wanted to do is that I wanted an emulator that would take the instruction, it would read the value at PC for four bytes, decode the instruction, perform the operations of that instruction, update and flush the registers to the register states, 
and then go to the next instruction. That's what I wanted. I didn't want something that lifts a block and optimizes and removes things and uh, elides register reads and writes if they don't need to be written twice or something like that. I didn't want that. I just wanted something straightforward. Um, I think it was no more than a thousand lines of code. It was not very complex, but I had full control over the emulator. I had confidence in, in how it worked. I knew how to modify things and the performance was so much better. So like QMU has a lot of overhead with random memory that it allocates when it sets up devices and, and just setting up the emulator state. Uh, whereas this model, it was maybe like a couple hundred bytes of metadata and then the memory state of the VM you're running. And that's it. It wouldn't, it didn't have complex uh, states there, which is really nice. Um, and that made it scale a little bit better and I could write my own MMU for it that then followed my conventions rather than QMU's conventions. Uh, and unfortunately, it turns out the performance was actually better. And I think at the time I was running... God, probably like 50 or 100 x86 cycles per MIPS instruction. It was it was not incredibly fast. Uh, it was good enough because speed wasn't the goal, but it was it was not super fast. So then I had this idea to template it with a JIT. So I would basically do. I, I had like 500 lines of code that, that was the MIPS simulator, and that was just handling all the instructions basically and and performing the operations. So I had this stupid idea that I could just allocate a gig of RWX memory, and I could append to it... Actually, I had, a, I had a better idea at the time. So, when you're writing a JIT, uh, and we're going to call this a translator instead of a JIT, but I'm still going to say JIT because it's easier to say. Um, so, when you have a JIT, you kind of have this problem where you need to figure out whether or not, like, when a... When a an indirect branch occurs inside the application, it is going to be saying, I want to branch to this PC address in the target address space, not the PC address that is the actual jitted RIP value in, in your JIT. Um, so you have like these complex lookups there where you need to figure out how things translate. You also have to worry about um, how things work if you're looking at unaligned instructions or if you're maybe executing instructions you're not supposed to, so like executing the delay slot instruction. Um, oh, so one thing that's really important throughout this whole thing is all of my emulators need to support ROP. My emulators cannot, cannot do what a lot of public emulators and public, uh, I guess emulators typically handle ROP, but like some of the binary lifting stuff typically doesn't handle ROP as well. Maybe it does, but a lot of times it doesn't because it will lift a function, make assumptions about things of like where the stack is, that the stack is valid, and all these different things, and then optimize with those constraints. And like, you see that a lot with symbolic execution where they'll like assume the stack is valid and, and these different things and they'll optimize out situations. Uh, but in reality, I might be fuzzing something and it might corrupt things so severely that it no longer resembles a realistic application, but I still need to be able to emulate that. Um, so I actually had this pretty brilliant idea at the time, uh, that I was convinced that I could emulate every single MIPS instruction in under 64 bytes of x86 assembly. So instead of doing some complex look up database tree of like PCs inside of the target translated to their JIT PCs. I just had this idea that I'm looking at like a firmware image that's like four megs in size. And four megs times 64 is 256 megs, tiny, negligible amount of RAM. So I had this idea. What if I just allocate 256 megs of RAM and this is MIPS, so every all instructions are four byte aligned. And then I will go through every four byte aligned word, or every four byte aligned 32 bit value in my program. I don't care if it's RO data. I don't care if it's data. This was a firmware image, so I don't even really know. Um, eventually, I kind of reversed out and learned the address space of this target. But let's just say I like 
I, I don't care. So I went through literally every single 4 byte offset in my dump, and then I jitted that. And if it was an invalid MIPS instruction, then I'd emit a UD2 or like a, a RET with a status code of like invalid instruction. And if it was supported, then I would just emit the instruction. And at the, at the end of an instruction, I would just do a branch to the next instruction, which would just jump to the next 64-byte boundary. And then that way, when an indirect branch occurred and there was like a jump to some PC value, all I would have to do is I'd have to take the PC value, subtract off the base of the firmware image, that would give me the offset into the image, multiply it by 64, and then add that to the JIT base, and that's where the instruction is. Don't have to worry about anything. I don't have to worry about jitting, I don't have to worry about lifting things dynamically, I don't have to worry about supporting things that have uh, been modified, because this didn't have uh, RWX memory, so that actually made it a lot easier. Um, but that was kind of where I, I first started going down that path. And that was, that worked great. That got me, I think, to like 1 or 1 1.5 x86 cycles per MIPS instruction. So at this point, I'm running, I'm emulating on like a, on like a 4 gigahertz Intel machine with 8 cores. I'm emulating like 32 gigahertz are 32 billion instructions per second in MIPS, which is fucking awesome. Like, there aren't MIPS processors that run that fast. This is faster than any physical MIPS hardware I could get. Um, so I kind of continued on that. I think I got to, like, 0.7 or 0.5 x86 cycles per MIPS instruction for the target that I had, uh, which was actually pretty phenomenal. I, I think I ended up, like, on my... I think I was running my AMD 6376, my quad socket box. So I, I, I was getting like up in the like hundreds of billions of instructions per second being emulated, which was fan fucking tastic. And since it's an emulator, I have full coverage and everything instrumented in the way I want, and I can track all kinds of state, which is awesome. So I think that's the, the best JIT that I ended up writing for. Uh, Scalar applications. So the next step after that, you know, all of these things, the like, the 64, the multiply by 64 decode tables, all those sorts of things work great when you have a fixed size application, when you don't have sparse memory addresses, uh, when you only care about MIPS because you have the like alignment things that can throw things off. Um, and that worked fine. It, it really did. That, that was okay. But I wanted to eventually work on like a real emulator that went the extra mile and probably used an IL. And that is basically lining up with when I bought this Xeon Phi. I can't remember if I had the idea for vectorized emulation before I bought the Xeon Phi or while it was shipping to me, but it was before I physically had it. So I'm pretty sure I bought this and I just expected that I would run my super fast uh, MIPS emulator on it, and I'd call it a day, and I'd probably end up writing a, a couple new emulators that have better perf things. But then I had this idea of using vector instructions for emulation, and it's pretty straightforward. If When it comes down to basic arithmetic operations, when the get... So, first of all, uh, all of this is working with snapshot fuzzing, and the concept of snapshot fuzzing is that unlike traditional fuzzing where you like run an application on a real system and then you randomly throw packets or files at it, snapshot fuzzing, you will load up the application, get to the point where it's about to receive data or maybe it has already received it and it's updated a buffer and a length and you take a, you put a breakpoint there and then you dump the entire state of the application. All of the memory, all of the register states, then you inject in, you overwrite the memory with the input file, and you update the length of the input file to be the correct size, corresponding to whatever you modified. And at that point, you can then resume execution of this snapshot, and you can see what happens with that input, and now you're fuzzing. Uh, what's really cool about snapshot fuzzing is it's much, much, much faster than traditional fuzzing. It's, I would say for... It depends on the target, but typically snapshot fuzzing probably will get you like a 50 or 100x speed up on fuzzing, 
Um, not because it will emulate or do anything faster, just because you'll be fuzzing only the parts of the application that are applicable to user input. You know, uh, this is a big thing that I did with Falkervisor when I was fuzzing Word. I was getting, I think, like four or 5,000 fuzz cases per second on Word, um, and that is a whole document file being slammed into Word and try and do that locally. You can't open multiple copies of Word, so you can't thread it. Uh, when you open a copy of Word, you have a splash screen that takes like five seconds. So the fastest that you can fuzz Word physically on a real machine or in a VM is like one fuzz case every one to five seconds. And I was running 4,000 fuzz cases a second. I was running the exact same code. It's not like I was running faster. It was I was just cutting out initialization and parts of the uh, parts of the application that weren't being used for parsing this input, which I don't affect the other parts of the application, so I don't care about them at all. They're not relevant to fuzzing. So snapshot fuzzing is, is basically that concept is save all the memory and register state when you get to an interesting point, modify your input in memory, and then resume execution to start fuzzing. So... This is pretty much all I ever do and probably ever will do. It's just kind of better in every way with the exception of if you have no way of snapshotting an application, which is typically just a like creativity problem and not a, a technical problem. Everything can be snapshotted and, and emulated. Anyways, so when doing snapshot fuzzing, what's really interesting is at the end of a fuzz case or at a crash or at a timeout or whatever, you reset the VM to the initial state every time. So you'll go and you'll change all of memory uh, to make it more performant. Uh, what you'll want to do is something called a differential restore, which I see Duck was asking in, in chat. So a differential restore is going through and it's only updating the memory which has been modified. Um, I would draw a diagram, but I don't think there's any thing that a diagram would actually help explaining here. So let's talk about it from the Fulkervisor perspective where I'm running a, I'm a full hypervisor and I'm running 64, 64 gig VMs on a machine with 512 gigs of RAM. So I can't actually fit all of the RAM for all the VMs on this machine. Um, so basically differential restores allow you to, uh, on on all, basically all hardware processors, the page tables have this concept of a dirty bit, of when memory gets modified, a dirty bit gets set in the page table that tells you that that memory has changed, that memory has been written to. And what that means is at the end of a fuzz case, I can walk the page table, and the page tables are relatively easy to walk, so um, this one I can actually draw a diagram on. So we'll go make a new diagram. And, okay, so this is the page table, and let's say this is uh, not, uh, not mapped, this one's mapped, this one's not mapped, and this one's not mapped as well. So page tables, if you're not familiar, are how your processor converts the virtual address of your application to the physical address uh, in actual RAM. And that is required because if you didn't have that concept, uh, you would have serious memory fragmentation issues. You'd never be able to make a one gig array, pretty much ever. Um, so virtual memory kind of allows those translations. So this is like the page table. This is what CR3 points to. Uh, that text is a lot smaller than what I wanted. I'm guessing if I change the text size once, it'll probably learn... Okay, so this is this is what like on x86, CR3 points to a table that looks like this, um, and I can draw an arrow. Ho oh, ho! Look at that. So CR3 is a hardware register, <coughs> system hardware register on x86, and it points to this page table. And the page table is in 64 bits, not using five-level paging. Are it's a four-level page table, where each level in the page table has 512 entries which corresponds to 9 bits because 9 bits are used to map 512 entries. And there are four levels, which means if you take 9 times 4, you get some number. I think it's 48 or 52 or, or 50. It's 48, I think. Um, and that is the maximum virtual address size on x86, and that's where that comes from. 
Uh, it, it's actually 9 times 4 plus 12, because the bottom paging bits are inside the pages. Anyways, so we have these page tables here, and let's say that this level, this is the next level page table here, and because that entry is mapped, and then we'll say that that, let's say this is the final page. This is a two-level page table, so this is really small, um, but whatever. We're, we're just going to say this is kind of how it looks, and we'll get her to see our three so it's not confusing. So the dirty bits are updated when a page is modified. So let's say I create this application that has this one page mapped, and I then perform a write to this page. What the processor is going to do is it's going to mark... Uh, it's gonna mark the boxes that I'm gonna highlight in I'm hoping I can highlight What's this background color? That's just on that style. Oh Yeah All right So the processor is going to update that this page has been modified by setting something called a dirty bit in the page table and then on x86, there's no dirty bit for higher level page table entries. It's only for the um only the uh, only the uh, final level page table entries have dirty bits. The top level entries have access bits. So these also have access bits. So accessed bits tell you whether or not a page has been used, whether a translation occurred, whether it was a read or a write or whatever. If a translation occurred of a page, the access bit gets set. If it gets written to, the final level entry has a dirty bit that gets set but all levelists in the page table have the access bit set. So, this is a really simple example, but let's just imagine that this is an 8 gig VM. There are 8 gigabooties of RAM mapped into this VM. And so, in that context, if you wanted to restore to a snapshot, and what basically everyone does, it's what Hyper-V does, it's what... Um, VMware does, it's what VirtualBox does, it's what Box does, it's what QMU does, I don't fucking know why, but for some reason, all of them will just replace all of memory with, like, something from disk. So you're gonna read 8 gigs from disk, you're gonna write 8 gigs to memory, and then you're gonna continue execution. But what you can do is, instead, I know that this snapshot started out in a clean state, I loaded up all of RAM, so at one point, I read 8 gigs of RAM from disk, I wrote 8 gigs of RAM to memory, and then I cleared all of the access and dirty bits in the page table that corresponded to that mapping of the snapshot. I then run that snapshot uh, until it crashes, or until it times out, or until it returns out with an error code, whatever my end condition is for a fuzz case. When it hits that end case, I can then look at the page table, and let's, uh, let's add another one here, and we'll put this in the blue... Uh, I don't know how I select that. Okay. So, anyway, so let's say this application is run, and it was 8 gigs that have run, but pages are 4K in size, 4 kilobytes in size, which is pretty small. So what I can do is this is the state of everything when I finished execution, and I'll align these because I, I'm so picky about that shit. Uh... Okay, that, and then that maps to here. We'll link that there. Okay. There we go. So, at the end of the fuzz case, instead of restoring 8 gigs of memory from disk or from memory or who cares where I'm restoring memory from, what I can do is I can walk this page table. So I can do a couple accesses. I can say, uh, I start off at the root level page table, as one does, and let's see, how do I move this thing? So I start off looking here. So I perform my memory access here, and I say, has this page been accessed? It has not, because it's not blue. So then I go here, has this been accessed? It has, so I go into the page table. I then do the same thing, has this been accessed? It has not, so I ignore that. This one has been modified, this one's dirty, and thus, I will then see, okay, this page needs to be restored. So I go into my snapshot, I find the 4K that is associated with this page, and I replace this 4K, and then I clear the dirty bits and the access bits. I don't know how I'm supposed to select that box without text editing. So that one's clear. 
because I, I did a I had 4K of copy there. And then I go here, I see that this one is accessed, but it's not actually um, modified. And so I'm fine with that. And then this one hasn't been modified. I'm now done with this page table level. So I go back up to the parent because I'm done with that traversal. I mark that as clear. And then I look at the last few entries and see that they're not used. And there we go. I just restored an eight gigabyte VM by performing one 4K copy in, in real x86, this would be 512 reads. So your best case scenario is it will take 512 reads for all of the entries in the uh, PML4, the highest level page table. It'll take 512 accesses. Those will likely be an L1 cache. So they'll be basically dumped out half a cycle at a time. So it will take you about 256 cycles to determine whether or not you have things you have to restore. And every time you have something to restore, you just traverse into the table, and then you end up replacing only the bytes that have been modified. So in this case, I would have done uh, 512 reads here for sure, uh, one right here, one right here, one right here, so three writes, 512 axes is here, 512 axes is here, uh, and then 512 for each level of the page tables here. So this would have been... Uh, 2,048 reads that are all sequential, which is really cheap, and then a um, three writes, and then a 4K write. So restoring this quote-unquote 8 gig VM, I restored only 4K of memory uh, because that was the only amount of memory that was touched during a fuzz case. And you might be thinking, well, that's not really realistic to have 4K used in a fuzz case. Well, that's Pretty true, 4K used in the fuzz case is, is definitely on the low side. It's feasible for some things, it, it truly is. Um, but more realistically, what you'll have is four to eight gigs of RAM for your mach machine, whatever you're emulating, and then you end up having a total number of like a meg. Like a meg is a big fuzz case. Like a huge target is gonna struggle to dirty more than a meg of RAM. Like Word and Chrome, when I fuzz those targets, barely use over a meg of RAM during a fuzz case, which means I'm restoring one meg of memory, which is pretty cheap. You can do that, like, you can probably do that 10,000 times a second per core, um, especially if you're sharing and numa localing, making numa local copies of your VMs and everything, which is what I did in Falkervisor. Um, and then scale that shit out to all your cores. All of this stuff linearly scales because you're not sharing things between cores. You're not locking anything. You have no locks in your implementation um, at all. So you literally just get the number of cores you have multiplied by your fuzz cases per second on a single core, and there you're chugging along and you're blasting 100,000 fuzz cases a second into Chrome on a $2,000 machine, right? So that is snapshot fuzzing. And that is differential restoring. And that's what I think anyone who's doing quote-unquote advanced fuzzing, anyone who is not doing just like fuzzing as part of a, as part of like a testing pipeline should be doing snapshot fuzzing. I, I, I just, it's so good. And the determinism is all there. Like... You start it off from the same state, you provide an input through, you'll get the exact same result every single time. Every time. It's 100% deterministic. There's no noise, there's no entropy, there's nothing that the processor can sneak in there. Every time, you, you got full determinism, you get like 100x the perf of, of just fuzzing something natively, you scale linearly with cores regardless of, of if the application allows threads or doesn't allow threads or allows multiple processes or like something like Chrome where you need to make multiple um, uh, where you need to make multiple different like snapshot or not snapshots like user profiles which then uses up a lot more disk space and you're hitting disk when you're loading all these chromium things it, it's just dude snapshot fuzzing is it, it's just the way <laughs> it's it's just the way it's a lot more technically challenging to wrap your head around like how to fuzz things in a snapshotting environment. It, it really is. I recognize that. Oh my God, but it's so worth it. And when you get comfortable with it, like 
I've worked with a couple people now that basically have never done anything but snapshot fuzzing just because that's kind of what I've always pushed. And they think in that snapshot fuzzing mindset, which it truly is a mindset because you have to think about how you're going to take a snapshot how are you going to take, like, where in your application it's worthwhile to take a snapshot? Where is worthwhile to put an end condition? When to stop fuzzing? Where to inject the input? How to safely modify the input in memory? How to figure out which devices or syscalls or whatever you have to emulate? Um, picking the emulator that you use to do all this and build all of this? Uh, it's, uh, it, it's, not, it's not easy, but... I think once you do it for like a year or two, it becomes pretty, pretty instinctual and it just becomes so much better than everything else. There, there's always a reason to run fuzzers locally. There's always some reason or, or another to do it locally, but it's important to understand uh, how much effort it would be to convert them into snapshot fuzzing because there's, there's always a cost. There's always... There's always an amount of time that you can invest into any target. It doesn't matter what it is. It could be a, a fucking iPhone. There's a certain amount of time it takes to emulate the devices that you need to emulate for whatever target you're looking at. And in almost every circumstance, you don't need to emulate any devices. If I'm fuzzing an iPhone, I don't need to emulate any hardware at all. No hardware is going to get touched during a fuzz case. It's just not, it's not a realistic thing like even disk i don't even have to emulate disk because disk isn't going to get hit in a fuzz case in pretty much any situation like in the time scale of your your like uh parser let's say you have some parser parsing some packet that's coming in uh, let's say it's like the iMessage stuff right you have some shit getting parsed from it externally uh the amount of time that's being spent parsing that packet is like microseconds Nothing's going to happen on the phone in a microsecond. No disk accesses are going to happen. No context switches are going to happen. No writes to the screen are going to happen. N nothing happens. In, like, when you're looking at what you actually are interested in fuzzing, almost nothing is happening on devices. So you don't need to emulate these peripherals. You have to if you want to, like, fully boot something. But if you have, a uh, like, an iPhone, I'm just going to root it and dump the kernel... Like, I'll, I'll make an atomic snapshotter, dump the whole kernel on an iPhone and the register state, and then load that in QMU or my own emulator or whatever and just continue executing. So, anyways, long tangent, but do snapshot fuzzing. It's amazing. Uh, I do have a tool that I worked on with a team at Microsoft that does snapshot fuzzing. It's meant to be really easy to use. It's not very performant because of that. Um, my goal is to open source it. There's some political hoops I have to jump through to get it open source. No one's against it going open source. So it's not like fighting with people to convince them that we should open source it. It's more about timings of things and whether or not we've used the tool enough internally because we don't want to release a tool and then get flooded with external bugs, even though that's like who wouldn't want that. But the financials there, like, bugs bugs found internally go through different, like, costs because they're paid for by the employee's time. Whereas bugs coming in externally are bug bounties, which are different payouts and all. all the, it's TLDR, bugs coming in externally is a lot more expensive than a bug found internally. Um, and while I don't give a fuck, like, I don't care, Right? I don't give two shits if some manager three levels up ends up getting a $10 million bill because a shit ton of bugs get poured into MSRC. I'm all for that, in fact. I would prefer that. If we were to release a tool and then over the next three months we had like millions of dollars in payouts because of this tool because people are using it to find all these bugs, do you know how fucking cheap that is? <laughs> like... To pay out $10 million to, like, for random bug fixes, like, a shit ton of bug fixes versus paying employees to do, like, employees are so expensive. Like, it, it's, it's crazy. Like, $10 million is, like, 20 FTEs for a year, right? Like, you could have 
hundreds of people externally reporting bugs. It's just, yeah, it's, it's, I don't know. Anyways, I'm kind of all about, like, while I, I do I do believe in some of the like questionings of releasing some of the like hacking tools, is that why Windows is being beta tested by the users? I mean that's because everyone, Microsoft included, every fucking tech company realized that they can fire all of their testers, add telemetry, and then not fix bugs, and no one cares. <laughs> like fire fire literally all your testers. Your product starts kind of getting worse, and no one gives a shit. <laughs> like, like, look at the start menu in Windows 10. I complain about this all the time. Look at the start menu in Windows 10. It doesn't fucking work. Like, you start typing something, it pops up the Bing search first, which is like, you really were able to query Bing to pull up a result for Kelk faster than you can see that Kelk is one of 50 installed applications on the system that's been indexed? Really? Yeah, start when you broke and I'm using WinR all the time. That's what happens when you file all your testers, but does it hurt Microsoft's bottom line at all? No, not at all. Like, everyone notices it. Everyone knows that it's getting worse. Everyone sees that software is getting hackier and hackier over time. Like, when 7 came around, and that was kind of like the pinnacle of what we had at the time for, like, design, UI, implementation, all those things. Windows 8 was a complete fuck-up. I think everyone realized that. And, like, we just never really recovered. Everything's been pushed, like... We have issues maintaining, like, old legacy Windows-y things. Just some of the basic services that come with Windows. And, like, people are adding so much code. And this goes... I'm, I'm not just saying this about Microsoft. Literally all companies. People are adding so much fucking code to things nowadays. How are we going to maintain that? Like, 10 years ago... Uh, like, 10 years ago or so, I think Windows was, like... 10, 20 gigs, maybe 50 gigs of source code, and now it's like 700 gigs of source code? How the fuck are you going to maintain that? How are you going to 10x, 20x the size of your code base? How do you maintain that? You can't. It's like everyone's adding one-off applications, and, and I really think this is an issue with development getting too easy, r slash uh, gatekeeping. Um... When development becomes so easy, you have so many people contributing code and not enough people to maintain it because nobody wants to fix a bug. No one wants to be on the hook for a bug fix. God forbid if it's a security fix. So, like, everything's kind of disposable. You see all these, like, apps and UIs and interfaces being thrown up, and then in a couple versions, they're just kind of deprecated forever. They're, they're, like, still around, and they still have to be maintained, and they're still attack surface, uh, but they're just kind of, they're just kind of deprecated. Microservices on the desk, yeah, dude, it's just, yeah. It really is. I mean, clearly, clearly it makes a lot of money, like, that's, that's why everyone's doing it. I, I really strongly disagree with it, man. I, I don't know. That's it's why it's why I'm back on Linux. It's it's weird. Like it's just it's absurd, man. I don't get it. HTOP hasn't had an update in a year. Well, HTOP is perfect. <laughs> it's perfect. Same with Vim. Like, if I get on a machine that has Vim six versus Vim seven versus Vim eight, I don't give a shit. It's so like I'm not using the, the bleeding edge features. 210 issues, perfect. I mean, I'm sure, yeah. Yes, there, there are definitely issues in, in all these things. But at the end of the day, if you use tools in their default configurations, they should always be supported in those default configs. And my default config for HTOP is I run HTOP, and then I look at it, and then I'll hit Q when I'm done looking at it. 
I don't, I don't use any of the F commands. I don't search. I don't do the tree stuff. I don't sort. I don't do any command line parameters. That's it. That's all I do, and it works fucking great for that. Um, and I don't think HTOP will ever break in that usage scenario. It might break in some weird edge casey things, of course. Same with Vim with weird configs. It might break, and same with all these different things, but the default cases work. The default cases on the start menu do not fucking work. <laughs> <laughs> like that's that's what bothers me is when the average use case of your application does not work that's when i have a problem uh am i a terrible person if i want htop but on web i don't want to have to keep a terminal open i mean i think everyone's a terrible person for wanting everything on the web but i'll give you a pass I recognize the convenience. I hate, I just hate the web. I hate, I hate everything moving to the web. I hate how literally everything is gonna stop fucking working. Like I can go take code from 1980, 1990, binaries, applications, whatever, and fucking run them. There is going, in, in 30 years, there's going to be basically no software that was developed between 2008 and beyond that will run. 30 years from now, it just won't fucking happen. Because the I, the domain name that backs all of the fucking Chrome or whatever is used to run the application won't exist anymore. It'll time out on launch and fail. It's, it is infuriating to me. I, I am livid at the way that development is going. It's so goddamn temporary Startups will make something, make a fucking product, make a website for it, sell it in a year. The company that bought it doesn't want it anymore. Three months later, they just shut down the site, and it's gone. It's just gone. Fuck that, dude. What are people doing? Like, the problem is it makes money. It's what people want, right? I don't own any IoT shit in my house. I hate it. It's just, I guess I have a nest because the previous owners hadn't installed. But I don't have any IoT shit here. If I bought cameras, I would put them up in CCTV them. Maybe I'd have them archived to EC2 or, or whatever, but that's backups. I wouldn't have them directly communicating with them. Like, it's so temporary. I, I, don't, I don't buy into any of this stuff, so I don't understand how it's making money. I really don't. But for some reason, it's what people want. Like, yeah, smart TV. Like, it's what people want, right? When, when people go into Best Buy, if you tried to sell them a normal fucking TV, they're going to be like, what do you think I am, poor? I want a smart TV. I want all the whiz-bang features. Does it have Wi-Fi integration? Does it have Netflix integration? Why? Why is this a thing? Everything's so temporary. Like in four years, when my like $2,000 television is no longer supported by Samsung, do you think Netflix is going to work on it when Netflix does an API change? Fuck no. My TV will be useless. Even though I could hook up a laptop with HDMI and plug it in, the smart TV features are so stupid. It's so stupid. Everything's so temporary. And I... I I just don't understand how people are buying all this shit. I really don't. Hopefully people will get a hint over Sonos and Tesla events. Yeah. You say I have a smart TV? I have to. You literally can no longer buy a nice TV that isn't a smart TV. I tried. I I tried. I turn all that shit off. I don't connect it to Wi-Fi, so it can't give me fucking ads. But, like, uh, Artings, um, Artings has, like, a list of, like, non-smart TVs somewhere. Uh, Somewhere they have, like, a list that's, like, non-smart TVs. It explicitly, like, maybe it's just all of them. There's, like, I remember just a big page of basically everything. You cannot get 
a TV over like three hundred dollars that isn't a smart TV, <clears throat> right? And if you do appreciate a 4K with like good picture contrast and all those things, TLDR, you cannot buy a non-smart TV that doesn't have those things. And I can guarantee you, in five years, smart TVs will be required. It'll like right now, I cannot hook my smart TV up to the internet, and it works fine. I can plug in HDMI. Fucking five years. Like, it's already pumping down ads. If I had Wi-Fi hooked up, it'll pump down ads to the TV that I purchased for thousands of dollars. But I can guarantee you in five fucking years, there's going to be, like, Wi-Fi as part of the setup process. And if you don't have it, it just won't work. It's, dude, it's unreal. Wait, I, I find it, I find it so funny. I find it so funny that... A lot of these like tech broy people are typically the most like left leaning, and I'm not trying to make this political, but about like everyone should just be able to like do whatever they can and like supporting and helping their community. But then they go and they fucking jam like temporary IoT microtransactions, ads on devices you purchase down everyone's dude. I fucking hate tech, man. I hate it. I hate tech. It's so annoying, but it works. Like, what are you going to do with your $2,000 TV that's getting stuffed ads from Samsung? You're still going to use it. So now they're making more money off you, and now they have continuous revenue off someone. I mean, it makes sense. Financially, it all makes sense, but it's so goddamn slimy. It's so slimy. You can't change the firmware because it forbids you from jailbreaking the hardware you bought. Yeah, that's a whole fucking another thing. God damn. Yeah. It's so it's so frustrating, man. It's so frustrating. Like I I I don't know. I don't know. I don't, I don't I don't know where things are going to go in the future, but like tech is literally just draining money out of society. It just it just is. It's squeezing every fucking cent. It's mining the shit out of their data, selling all of their stuff to customers that they know aren't going to do legit things with it. It's so goddamn sketchy, dude. It's unreal. Like, I feel like in 30 years from now, we're going to be looking at tech in this era, and we're going to be like, that is some of the most immoral fucking Enron bullshit. So frustrating. So frustrating. And that that applies to basically the whole fucking industry. Like, big firms, small firms, startups, contractors, doesn't fucking matter, dude. Everyone's doing the same shit. Anyways, let's talk about vector simulation. <laughs> Wouldn't mind a phone that's as powerful as my current computer as long as it's possible to hook up six monitors? Yeah. I really just want, like, a, a phone that's just, like, a, a phone with, like, a browser. My, I just got an update on my Samsung phone, and now I'm getting, like, notifications pushed down by force that are basically ads. That, that are ads. It's, dude, it's so annoying. A lot of, a lot of the, like, phone things are really gimmicky. Like, a lot of the, like, open source, you know, friendly... F dude, literally, I just want a fucking terminal, dude. Give me a phone with a physical keyboard, put a modem on there, and I will type text space phone number slash contact name space message. Hit enter. Call space number. Enter. I don't need a fucking GUI on my phone. <laughs> Anyways, that's me. I am definitely not up to the times with computing. I don't think I ever will be. A web browser is nice, I will say that. But I don't need apps. I really don't. I don't use any fucking apps. It's just not a thing. Like, the only app that maybe I would be frustrated to not have is like Uber and Lyft. But I could easily get by just calling cab companies. Like, it's not that big of a deal.
is is re- it's really not that hard to talk to a human. If I ever break my phone, I'd be writing my own apps for it, all terminal based. Yeah, that sounds pretty sweet. Anyway, so that's a tangent of how tech is really shitty and slimy right now. Um, I think we're gonna regret it. I think we are. I think in like 15 years, we're gonna look back on all the money that was very temporarily made, and we're gonna regret it because we'll have left software and everything in fucking shambles. Everyone will have, like, fucked up all the RFCs. Like, Google basically writes all of the web RFCs now. They basically force browsers to implement features by adding them to Chromium and adding them to YouTube and Gmail, which are so widely used that other browsers are forced to support them, or they don't have Gmail or YouTube support, which is donezo. It's just really weird, man. It's so strange. I don't I I just I don't get it. All right. So, with vectorized emulation, we can basically go through and uh perform like multiple of these operations in parallel, which is amazing. But for normal arithmetic operations, it's it's a relatively easy problem. It's it's really not that difficult. So, for example, if I'm running uh, since since this isn't snapshot fuzzing, and we restored all of the VMs to the exact same state, we know that all of the VMs that we're about to run are about to do the exact same things. They're about to read the exact same instructions with the exact same data. Uh, Everything is the same. Register state memory is all the same, except for maybe the input that has been modified, the, the like fuzz case input. So when you resume execution, you actually know that the, at least the first instruction is going to be the same instruction on all of them. It's possible it could be a branch based on the input file, in which case it would immediately diverge. But let's assume that it just does like a sub-RSP or like a makes room on the stack for something, in which case you can perform that operation with a single subtract on all of the VMs at once. And that was basically the, the goal of um, vectorized emulation. So I, I, I saw that. I saw that for normal arithmetic operations, you can simply perform those operations, trivially, not a problem. So then it kind of gets a little bit more difficult when you get to memory accesses. Because when you get to memory accesses, you might have situations where things do like a, a multiple deref. So if they're all reading the exact same address, it's actually really easy. You can just deref memory once, and you have the same value in all of them. So in this case, um, let's, uh, let's draw up a load here. So we're gonna say, we're gonna say that the target instruction, oops. We're gonna say that the target instruction that we wanna run is like a, uh, a load into R0 from R1. And if R1 is not influenced by the input file, then R1 is going to be the same between all of the lanes of this vector. Between all of the VMs are going to be reading from the exact same address. So what you can do is actually make memory interleaved on quadward boundaries, because this is performing a quadward load, and if you interleave all of memory, so like this would be, let's say this is address zero. Oops. So let's say this is address zero and then address one, OX, uh, this is actually gonna be eight. So this is the VM zeros quadward value at zero and then VM1s, VM2s, and VM3s at zero. And then at eight, you just do another copy of these things and you're all good. Now what this means, and this is how I currently implement it, and what this means is that even though this is actually in, in RAM, this is actually at OX 60 or 40, which is 64 bytes, um, not true for this example because these are four byte lanes, but or four lanes instead of eight lanes, but whatever. So what this means is that at the very start of a load, I can determine if they're loading from the same address relatively cheaply. 
If that is the case, then I can simply perform a single 512-bit load of this memory. And this will correctly load the values for their corresponding VMs into the right locations. Now, obviously, if I'm doing a sub quad word access or, a, uh, or an access that splits a boundary, then I need to shift and mask things in or potentially perform two loads and merge them together. Uh, but in the case of a, an aligned load, which is almost all the loads, uh, I can just perform a single load of everything which is fantastic, and that's what I currently do. So for memory accesses of the same value, that's really easy. Now for differing values, it also turns out it's not too difficult. Uh, there are actually scatter gather instructions on AVX 512, which means that I can perform page table walks for all of the different addresses in parallel. So that means that I can go through, and I have a, a whole blog where I kind of talk about just the MMU aspect of this, uh, but TLDR, it's not really a big issue because I can just perform parallel walks and treat them all as separate values and have them fetch the right things from the page tables, and at the end of the day, I get the values for all of the different addresses that they accessed. So loads are not a problem either with vectorized emulation. And that leaves one thing, which is the hardest part, branches. Indirect branches, or um, direct branches are easy <laughs> because all of them flow with the branch. But the hard part are indirect branches and conditional branches. Because with vectorized emulation, you get to a point where you end up with one VM. Let's, uh, let's, draw, let's draw the catastrophic case. And this is where uh, compare fuzz input and then I wonder if I can do a new line in here I probably can hell yeah I can uh, jump not zero uh, other branch or jump not equal we'll say just to make it simpler we'll change the box size oops okay so this is where things get really difficult in vectorized emulation. And the reason this gets really difficult is because now you start to have kind of a chart where you have different blocks. And you have, let's say, the compares in this block. Oh my god, dude, this is going to make making visualization so nice. Oh yeah. Align that to the side. Oh, look at that. And let's just say, on this case, we've got add racks 5. And then on this case, it's this is a really complex one. This one's going to do a sub racks 5. And then apparently I can just draw arrows like that by just dragging off that like arrow thing. Oh my god, that's nice. Fuck yeah. I can color this. I'm going to turn this. This is going to be the... Oops. This is going to be the taken branch. That work? That make that green? Font color. Oh, here we go. Bam! Make this red. Bam! Wow! Oh, look at that! Woo! <laughs> All right, that's pretty cool, actually. I, I got to say. Now, what's not cool is this being not fixed. There we go. Make these all fixed point. Uh, you know what? Courier new looks pretty good here. There we go. Okay. So we end up with situations like this that are... Ooh, are there different points where I can branch this from? Oh, yes, there are. Dude, that's sick. <laughs> that's golden red... <laughs> <laughs> That's golden red, actually, but no worries about colorblind. No colorblindness here. Ah, <laughs> uh, okay. And then, who cares about if they actually merge up into the same block? Anyways, so here we have this very green color here. <laughs> um. Okay, so basically. In this situation, it gets really difficult because 
uh, when we go into this operation, we are running all the lanes. So let's say, let's say at the start, oh, now all the colors are going to be a little messy. We'll change this back to black. And we're going to say all VMs active. Whoops. So at this point, all VMs are active. And then here, we're going to say that like, we're going to say that six VMs want to go here. So six of them want to go down that path. And two of them want to go down this path. All right, and now we're in a hard spot where we can't do a vectorized we can't do a vectorized add and we can't do a vectorized sub because if we do an add, then we'll end up causing these six VMs to have the wrong value, and if we do a vectorized sub, then we'll cause these two VMs to have the wrong value. So that leads to why AVX five twelve is amazing. So AVX 512 has a concept called K-mask registers. And these K-mask registers allow you to make really cool looking instructions like this, where I can do a vector packed add quadward into ZMM0 uh, using a K-mask K1, ZMM1, ZMM2. And what this is saying is K1, since we're adding quad words, that means there's eight different values. So K1 is an 8-bit value. And this is saying, perform an add for all of the lanes, which are marked as 1 in this 8-bit value. There's a 1-bit for every lane in these vector registers. And this is saying that only perform the addition if and only if the bit is set in that mask register. Uh, you can also do this, which is zeroing, and this would mean that it would then zero out the, the ones that are masked off to cause the result to be zeroed. It's a little bit more efficient because it doesn't have to um, wait for the merging, but this, this is amazing. Basically, you take these two things, you add them together based on which ones aren't active, you then store the results in ZMM0, and then you leave the ones that were inactive in, ZM in ZMM0 untouched. You just don't modify them. So now, we can actually do this conditional branch fucking magically. So here, what we'll do is, ideally we want to follow the most common path. It doesn't really matter because we're going to come back to execute it anyway, so it doesn't actually matter, but let's say that we p figure out this is the most common path. So here we're going to say update kmask such that uh, the two taken path VMs are disabled. And now what that means is I can now execute a sub instruction even though some of the VMs wanted to go down here and perform an add. I can actually perform the sub because the sub will not be applied to the VMs that went down this path because we turned those VMs off. We just disabled them. And that's cool. So let's say the end of this block is the end of our first case. So at the end here, we can figure out that there are two VMs that have not completed execution yet and that still want to run. We have six VMs. Uh, so in this case, this will end in a fault. So this will be six VMs faulted. Even though it's not actually a fault, uh, the act of like exiting or trapping or ending uh, fuzz case is going to be, it'll look like a fault to my IL, in which case I update those. And then it's going to see, uh, are there any unfaulted VMs which want to, want to still run? In which case... The answer is yes, there are these guys up here. So what we're going to do is we'll go back and we'll execute these two VMs, perform the add, and then these will fault, and then it's all eight VMs faulted, done fuzzing. So that's the logic that has to happen here. Uh, then flip all bits in K-mask and execute the other block. Uh, when is it best to backtrack to the other branch at the very end of execution? Basically, when 
when you have nothing else to execute on what you're following. So mask, 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 until eventually you get down to one, uh, or hopefully multiple, ideally multiple for the performance benefit, but it doesn't really matter. And then you get to the end, and then you make the decision at the very end, when they all, when they have faulted off the path that you followed, you go back and make the decision. And the reason for that is the decision making is too expensive to do per block. You cannot make the decision of re-executing things per block, it's just, it, it would be too much overhead. Um, you could maybe do it per function or something like that, and I've thought about it, but it doesn't look like, theoretically, it will be that much of an improvement. It should be a, an improvement, but it's non-zero. How do you handle infinite looping? Uh, that'll be faulting with a timeout. But anyways, that is basically the problem that I have to handle. Now, it's a solved problem. This is, uh, this is not a um, unsolved problem. It's, it's possible. It's doable. There's no problems here in, in actually doing it. Uh, but it is the stage that I'm at in this new version of Vector Simulation. My old version handled this just fine. No problems. But it is a little bit more simple of a... Um, IL, which made it a little bit easier to implement this logic. So, I'm going to take a bio break, and I'll be right back to explain. We'll finally get up to speed with exactly the problem that I'm having that we're going to be looking at solving with the, like, two hours or three hours left that I have remaining. Be right back. All right, now we got to talk about the hard problems. So does anything about this problem look particularly hard? About this part here? <coughs> Doesn't look that hard, right? <coughs> That's what I thought. In my head, it didn't look that difficult. Turns out it's really fucking hard. And I'll tell you why. So this example here, it looks really simple. And it looks really straightforward, right? You perform this compare, check the result, you mask things off, you go down this path, and then you go back and you re-execute these two things. Perfect. Conceptually, very simple. The problem is, when you actually do that in your head, and this is something that has been like really staggering to me recently when I'm thinking about kind of my thought processes and thing that, things that hang, hang me up. So we're just going to move this to another page. Fuck it. Doesn't really matter where we put it. We'll put it here. So... This is pretty easy conceptually because you're ignoring, when, when you think about this, you're ignoring what it actually technically takes to implement this, right? Um, and let's talk about that. So I'm going to write a slightly more complex example, and then we're probably going to end up writing that example in my IL such that we can run that example. So this example that we're going to write is going to be very real. Um, it's going to be something that right now I don't handle because I have some uh, technical problems in the way that I do my IL. So let's say we're going to do a compare with 5. Um, I'm actually just going to do a compare with, with R, 
reg zero. Doesn't really matter. I'm, I'm going to call that A. Compare A with 5. This is going to add B5 and sub B5. And let's say, uh, let's give these initial register states. So um, now we actually might want to go to 8. <laughs> because we're, since we're going to be making this a real, a real example, we're actually going to go to 8 here. Uh, so we're going to make this a group. And then, you know, once I learn the hotkeys to this, I feel like I'm going to be lightning fast. Okay, I just want to be able to fit. I just want to barely be able to fit, like, three numbers in here. I want to make it as small as possible that I can fit three numbers. Group. Yeah, look at that. I used a hotkey. One more. Mm, this. This, this, this. Honestly, I'm just going to make that evenly sized so that it lines up with the grid. That looks pretty good. So this is going to be the template for group those and make that a template. That's our eight lane example. Okay. So since we're going to write an actual application now, we have to define some of these initial register states and, and things uh, to think through this problem. And I haven't fully thought through this problem, so we're, we're now at the point that I'm going to start making mistakes because I don't necessarily uh, know what I'm going for here yet. So this is uh, A. This is the A register. These are initial states. Um, this is going to be the B register. Very, very creative architecture. Uh, and let's say the A register, we're going to have, if it's not equal, um, and we're going to say, um, if A is not equal to 5, um, we're going to say, yeah, compare A with 5, I can just do this, to be honest, in my IL. Pretty, pretty close to this. We'll like pseudocode it. So if A is not equal to 5, then we'll go here. Otherwise, we'll go here. So let's have the A register. We're going to have a couple with 5. Just kind of randomly picking some. We'll put 6 in the others. Cool. So at this point, there is going to be a conditional branch based on um, some of these some of these registers. So we have a register before execution. All of these VMs are active. All eight VMs are active. And we're going to go through. And if the if it's not equal to five, then we're going to go down here. I'm going to make it equal to five because it, it just is a little simpler to think about. It doesn't change the problem at all. So if the VMs are, if A is five, then it'll perform an add. Otherwise, it'll perform a sub. So in this case, we have a five, a five, a five, so three of them will go down this path, and then we'll have five of them go down this path. That's pretty neat. So here we'll have adds and subs being performed, and then B, we're going to have zero, 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 oops, zero. I guess I need to zero, zero. And we're going to put, uh, we'll put these at 16 here. So we're making the problem a little bit harder. So now down here, um, and I'm going to, I'm going to do this. I'm going to have this be sub 16. Okay. And that should be a healthy mix. Those actually, we're gonna do this. That's now a healthy mix where we have some fives at zero, some sixes at sixteen. So we have a five and six at sixteen. We have a five at zero and a six at zero, and the rest don't really matter. So down here, I'm now going to perform a uh, load B. We'll say this is load quadrant B. Same thing here. So this problem just got a lot harder, <laughs> um, and I'll show you why in a, in a second. Okay, uh, what is the goal of vectorized emulation? Uh, 
extremely fast emulation of any target that I want. Um, super fast emulation. So the actual emulation the, in terms of running the instructions, I want to make faster. The, uh, so I want the instructions to run faster than any other emulator, so it has to perform better. It has to be able to handle snapshot fuzzing, so very quick resets. It has to have stronger than ASAN memory protections where I can punch byte holes in the middle of memory and it will fault if that byte is accessed, even if it's part of a larger access. Um, I want to be able to track uninitialized memory. I want to be able to track uninitialized register states. I want to be able to fuzz in the middle of functions without having the state of the function, like just literally put PC in the middle of function uh, in the middle of a function and resume execution and have it give you a correct result. Um, it is it is like the pinnacle of everything that you would ever want for fuzzing. If you're willing to invest infinite time. <laughs> Anyways. So, I'm then going to have those perform loads. Uh, and we're going to load these into the C register. Uh, and then have these load, C register. And then we're going to add another <laughs> instruction. Uh, so let's see, add five. I'm actually going to do add eight here. I'm a little bit happier with that. It just makes it easier. It doesn't change the problem at all. Then here... I'm gonna do a uh, branch indirect to C. There we go. And then C, um, that's gonna be based on the, the memory contents. So I think I can give basically the same memory contents for all of these because they're gonna load different addresses. No, I want to give different memory contents. So we're going to say uh, these are either going to load at 0. Uh, actually, they're, they're going to load at 8. If they go down this path, they're going to load from 8 because B plus 8. Uh, and then down in this path, they're going to sub. So they're going to load from 16 or negative 16. So we only care about the 8 and 0 uh, addresses. So we're going to say is, and then the C register doesn't matter because we're not using the uh, previous value in it. So this is going to be mem at OXO. Oh, okay. Perfect. So let's say the memory at zero, uh, and, and let's also say that this block is PC. We're going to say, oops. So we're going to say that this block, uh, PC, oops, I need to drag these. I keep forgetting that. PC is OX elite 1, 2, 3. So this is the address that we're starting execution at. All of them are starting execution at the same point because that's the realistic situation. We're going to go. We're going to lift this graph. We're going to figure out that we want to... This is the graph that we're going to lift. And then we're going to have memory at 0, which is going to be accessed here. Uh, we're going to have... We're going to have 0, 1. So these are... What is this? If it's not equal to 5, so the 6 paths... Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to label these a little bit. So I'm going to do this. We're going to fill those... This is the red path. This is the non-taken path. It's just gonna be helpful for me visually. And then this is the taken path. Okay. So that is for the first conditional operation we're gonna go through. And uh, in the fall through case, we're gonna have a bunch. We're gonna have one, two, three, sixteens. So I'm gonna zero out this register. Okay. If memory is striped like this, would that hinder restore performance? Um, no, I wrote a yes and no. So the 
I actually store the original VM state in the striped state such that I can just do a direct copy. So I've already kind of handled for that case. So the, the restored memory, the memory that I will copy from when restoring memory is, has already been striped. So I don't have to worry about that. Um, but yeah, I, I have the, the restores are super fast. It, it's like not even a perf concern. Yeah. The, re the restoring in here is just not, I don't even think about it anymore. It's just such a solved problem. Anyways, so down here we have a couple things. Um, and I'm going to say memory at 8 as well. And then, uh, and then we're going to make another note here. Uh, all other memory is unmapped. Yeah, 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 like that curveball? I don't. I mean, I do, but I don't. Okay, so that makes it a lot more difficult, right? So now we have, we have a conditional branch that's going to cause these to go down different paths. Then here, uh, let's go down this because it has the three, this green path. Uh, shout out to Green Path in, in uh, Hollow Knight. <laughs> we have this Green Path where we're going to load, we're going to add 8 to B. And the B register is 0, 0, or 16, so we're going to end up with 8, 8, and 24. 24 is unmapped, so that's going to cause a fault. So one of them is going to get disabled due to a fault on a load. Two of them will remain, which will be these two. Uh, and then they're going to perform a load from 8... And we'll just fill in their eight values. We'll have one branch to PC1, and we'll have one branch to PC2. And the rest of the memory there doesn't matter. Um, so we're going to mark these as the survivors. So I'm going to highlight highlight this, that survive. That'll be blue, and this will be blue. So these will survive past the faults. And then in this case, we have a subtract B16 so any ones with 16 will be 16, uh, all of these red ones. Otherwise, they'll go to negative 16, which will be faulting. So we have basically all of them that are 16, which are these three. These will continue execution. One, two, three. Everything else will get faulted off. So that's what I expect at the end. And then I'm going to make... Two new blocks. These blocks are going to be real simple. Um, we're going to make a round rectangle. And this is going to be a trap. Uh, and then this one's going to be trap. And then we're going to do PC equals whatever. PC equals this. Dude, drawing this diagram is actually really helping me think through this problem. I'm going to do this more often now. For sure. So this is going to be PC is... Oops. PC is equal to... Especially as I learn this tool and get better at it. This will be PC is 2. So what that basically means is we're going to have divergence based on the red and green. The green paths are going to go here. And the red paths are going to go here. Then they're going to perform a modification of B, which is going to be an address that they're going to use for loads and stores. Um, the blue ones are going to be what survives, and these are going to be, uh, can I do that? I'm going to do that, and then, what was it? It was one, two, three. I'm going to just do this. Deselect, deselect, deselect. Eh, I'm just going to make this green. And this one I'm going to make, oops, I did that the wrong way. That's red. And that's green. Okay. So this path is the only one that's going to actually access at zero. And thus, that is the red memory accesses. And that's going to correspond to these red lanes. And these red lanes, uh, only the ones where 16 is present, will it get subtracted, become zero, where the uh, load will succeed. In which case, we'll do one, two, three. Uh, and actually, we're going to do one, two, two. I've been thinking about getting a Wacom, ta uh, Wacom, I don't know how to pronounce it, a uh, tablet for hand drawing diagrams. Would you consider that? I, I need perfect rectangles. I'm so picky 
about everything like lining up on a grid perfectly. Unfortunately, I, I don't think I could draw these things out. I, I Yeah, I just, ah, uh, drives me nuts. I don't know why it shouldn't. Okay. <laughs> so let's talk through all of the lanes. We've color coded them so it's a little bit easier to see, kind of, sort of, uh, but not 100%. So if these are all scalar VMs, remember, the b behavior in vectorized emulation has to be identical as if you were to just run all of the VMs completely separate from one another. So let's look through VM0. VM0, we'll start here. Is A equal to 5? It is. So it will go here. It'll then add 8 to B. B was 0, so B becomes 8. It's going to load a quad word from memory address 8, which is successful, which then will cause it to load from this location, which is 1. So it will load a 1 from memory. Uh, and then it will do a branch indirect to 1. It'll look up this, and then it will trap. OK, that's one case. This path is A equal to 5. It is not. So we're going to go down this path. It's going to subtract 16 from B. B becomes 0. We're going to deref 0. 0 contains a 1. We're going to Branch indirect to 1. Perfect. That survived. Uh, this one. It is the exact same thing as the first lane, except it's going to branch to this trap instead. Doesn't really matter. It's basically the same. It's technically a different PC. Cool. Then we're going to look at this lane. Is A equal to 5? It is not. We go down this path. We subtract 16 from B. That makes B negative 16. That performs a load of negative 16 or all Fs with a zero. That's going to fault. That's going to end up faulting. So that's going to fault on this load instruction. And it's that's going to be the end of its execution. Uh, then we have this one. Is A equal to 5? It is. Goes down this path. It adds 8 to 16. Gets 24. DRF's 24. It faults. This one. Is A equal 5? It is not. Go down this path, subtract 16. It's the same as that one. It's going to fault. This one, in fact, these two we've set up to be the same. They go down this path. They subtract 16 from B. B becomes 0. They both derev 0. They both have 2 and 0. They both branch to PC2. Okay, so that is basically the hard problem that we want to solve. Once again, doesn't really seem like that hard of a problem, uh, but it starts to become it when you, uh, yeah. So when we're looking at this as a human, when we're reading through this graph and, and thinking through what this should do, um, we're keeping the state machine in our head, uh, which is actually really easy to do, but programming that cleanly is a hard problem. And here's, here's the reason for that. Let's look at it vectorized now. We're going to look at it vectorized. And we're going to say, uh, for vectorized emulation to work, we need a following VM. So we're going to say that uh, VM0 is going to be the following VM. So this is the following VM, uh, which I think is accurate. So basically, this is the VM that we're going to follow when it makes decisions. So we're going to mask, mask things off that aren't doing the same thing that VM0 are doing. So let's go through. Um, is A equal to 5 on all of these? And the answer is it's just the greens. Whatever is green here is, is the case that we want to follow. OK, so that means that we have to mask off K mask. So we're going we're gonna to go here. And K mask, uh, we'll just say, we'll move this up. We'll move this up. We'll make a copy of this. This is going to be K mask. And I actually call the online K mask, I call it online. These are the VMs that are actively running. So we're going to call that online. Uh, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, oops, 1, huh. One, one, one. That one box seems to behave differently. Okay. Saw so your Maple videos. Do you recommend any source code, uh, any source to learn code analysis with Ida Ghidra? Not really. I think just getting into it is kind of the best way, unfortunately. Okay. And then this is the VM we're following. Cool. So we'll move this down a little bit, just so we're 
kind of off screen from the other diagram. All right. Woo. Um, and then we have another state that we're tracking. <laughs> now, now that we're turning this into a real problem, we're actually starting to get state. And I don't know why that one is unaligned there. Fuck it. I really don't. I don't know why that's unaligned by like a small amount. Maybe I was holding shift when I moved it. Oops. This. Okay. Well, I fixed it somehow. Uh, I didn't grab online. Oops. Boop. Okay. Damn it. I keep I keep screwing up my copy copy pasta. There we go. And we'll put that there, one separated. And this is the faulted VMs. And this is the VMs that have uh basically I had this realization last night, and I think it's correct, um, that I need two different K-masks for things to work. Uh, and the reason for that is if I have one K-mask register, the online mask, so the online mask is what I use to determine whether or not I want to execute instructions. But it's possible that things can get forked due to a conditional branch like this that doesn't cause them to be faulted and we want to know to bring them online. We have to turn them off, we disable them in the online bits, but we have to know that those VMs are still active. So I actually have kind of an inverse mask that I call faulted VMs. And let's see if I can do this. I cannot. Okay. So, god damn. Control Y is not redo. I guess it's probably Control R. Control Shift T. Okay. Zero, 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 zero. So that's the initial state, I think, completely now. But not quite yet. That's not that. That's not the full initial state. <laughs> but faulted VMs has been set to zero because none of them have faulted. All of them have been set online. All of them are executing at that PC. Uh, we're not really going to track PC because I don't... Uh, actually, uh, we do have to track PC, <laughs> unfortunately. And we're going to make this PC is equal to uh, 8 because that's the first key that I happen to hit. Uh, we're going to put that here, I think. I want to swap these around because these are like control states. I'll just do this. That. Move this one down. That's going to become PC. <laughs> then we have the online VMs. Whoops. Online VMs. Cool. And then PC, eight for all of them. All right, so, and then we technically have this C register, but the C register doesn't matter because we're, we're going to, we don't, we just use it as a temporary. It won't exist as an actual hardware register. It'll be a um, IL register, so we won't have to worry about that. Okay, so we're following VM0. PC is 8 for all of them. And cool. And this, this, I think this is a perfect example now. Okay. So th this is the state on the prior to executing any instructions. Then I'm going to execute one instruction. More specifically, it's a couple condition. It's a conditional branch. But we're going to perform a conditional branch. And here we go. Here is the state. <laughs> Here's the state. Uh, so we'll say we're gonna we're gonna give these identifiers. We're gonna say that this is zero. We're gonna home these to the 
side. And then we're going to say this is uh, 0, 1, 2. We're going to indicate that this, say that this is like block 1, block 2. And we'll give these labels 0, 1, 2. Okay. Block one, block two. Okay, so there is our goal. Well, this is our graph. So this is this is our program. Son of a bitch. Shift select. Yeah, buddy. All right. So we'll put our program in here. Get rid of the fill. And this is the. Oh, I see. I added them down here. I keep, I keep thinking it's gonna let me like draw them, but that's how diagramming stuff works. So this is the program. Put a label here, program. So this is the program that we're gonna be executing. This is the uh, state at uh, initial state. And then this is, I'm just going to delete this so I can grab this. We're going to bold that. We're going to put this in a square, a rectangle. <laughs> okay. Um, I need to add a couple more state things because that's not... Uh, I guess so far that's the complete state, but it's very quickly not going to be the complete state. On this instruction, it's already no longer enough state to track. So this is... Uh... <laughs> yeah, welcome, welcome to misery. Okay, how do I select that? Send that to back? I see. Nice. Now I should be able to select these. Cool. State at... Block zero, zero. <laughs> oh, this is going to get great, man. You get, you guys get to suffer with me. <laughs> Welcome to hell. Also, yo, what's up, MetaConstruct? We're going to call this block zero. Uh, send it back. Block zero. All right, simple. I like suffering now. S smile. <laughs> All right. So, okay. So here's what happened. We executed one instruction. What were the results of that instruction? Well, okay. So we are following VM0, which means we're going to actually follow the ones that are going down the same decision as VM0. VM0 has A equal to 5, which means that we're going to go to block 1. That means that any of them that are masked off, or any of them that are going the red path need to get masked off. So they will set online zero. All right, so uh, yeah, we have a problem now. <laughs> and the pr <laughs> this is where it gets re really difficult. And I think I, I think I know how I wanna, I actually don't know how I wanna solve the problem yet. So those VMs have not faulted. So correctly, we have not set those VMs to faulted VMs. That's good. We don't want to set those to faulted VMs. That is correct. Uh, we do want to mask them off from online. And that means that when we look at the inverse of faulted VMs, um, we can safely see that anything that is not faulted, we can potentially pick up and re-execute again. And is that true? Can we go right, right now with the state that we have, can we go... Uh, and re-execute um, the things that we have masked off? And the answer is no. And that sounds, uh, actually we're gonna say state at block one zero, right? Because we've taken that branch, right? Um, the answer is no. And the reason is we don't know 
where the VMs that got masked off got left behind. And if we don't know where they got left behind, then we have no way of re-executing them because we can't just go and resume execution where they were. They don't have a PC register because this block is not updating PCs. Nope. These are not updating PCs. And that is why this was not a problem in my first IL, is I did not have a concept of a block, or I didn't have a concept of instructions in my IL that weren't associated with a PC. But I now have that. And the reason for that is I want to be able to implement complex instructions inside of my IL. So, um, back in my first IL, and this is why we're here. This is, this is why the, I'm having new problems is because I, I've made design decisions. So back when I did my first IL, there are some issues with a couple different instructions. The MIPS uh, branch likely instructions, but we're not going to talk about those because I don't think people are very familiar with them. And then the um, x86 repeat instruction prefix. So the repeat instruction, if you're not familiar with x86, uh, the repeat instruction on x86 will look something like this. Uh, rep uh, stows b I mean, that's, that's actually a valid instruction. That is implicit. Um, rep stows B is an implicit ESDI. Is it stows B? Yeah. So what this is going to do is this is going to... Um, what this one instruction is going to do, this is going to while RCX is not equal to zero... This is the code that implements this instruction in C-ish. While RCX is not equal to zero, move uh, DREF ESDI and assign AX uh, DI++. I need to make this. There we go. One, two, three, four. One, one two, three, four. I'll try and expand this a bit. Oops. There we go. DI++. There you go. That's the pseudocode. So this is basically what that instruction looks like. So when I lift this to my IL, I actually need to have an internal branch that's not associated with a PC. So my original IL, everything was PC-based, and thus whenever I had a branch in my IL, it was based on a PC value. Um, however, in this new IL, since I have a graph-based IL, I can make an internal anonymous, as I call it, block. And in this case, all of these are anonymous blocks. They're not associated with a PC, except for the first one. So PC is 8 is associated with block 0, such that if bind, if this branch, uh, if this branch indirect were to branch to PC 8, it would actually grab this exact graph and it would just jump up to the top. It would go re-execute the exact same JIT entirely. Um... And that, that were great, but uh, I ran into a couple instructions like this, and almost every architecture had something of this state. It also means that if I tie blocks to PC values, then I cannot, I can't implement loops in my IL that aren't tied to actual loops in the target program, and that hurts instrumentation. If I want to implement some instrumentation or some hooks or some code injection on certain conditions or modify the target code, I want to modify it in the IL. And the previous version, I couldn't do that. I could only modify the assembly of the original code. And that means I couldn't insert code unless I found a code cave. So I'd have to, like, add a jump, jump to some scratch memory that I maybe added, have it do some different things, and jump back. And what I want with this version of the emulators, I want the ability to say, on compares with 5... I want to add extra IL code that does a certain thing, and maybe there's a loop, and maybe it updates something and, and, and something else. And when, it, when, when I want that feature, it means I need to have an anonym, 
anonymous blocks, uh, which is what I currently have. So, I do have this problem solved in the current version. Um, since you're optimizing at the graph level, you actually lose association between PC and IO blocks. Yes. Yes, I do. Welcome to die. <laughs> yeah. So while these problems are not difficult when we're talking about, like, what we want them to do, it's really fucking hard when it's like optimizations have happened, PCs are no longer associated. Um, I actually have implemented this IL very specifically that the PCs don't even have to exist. Like, you can implement an emulator that doesn't even use a PC. You can have a non... You can have something without a program counter, and that's actually what I do for my benchmarking suite. So the program, encounter, the program counter is only used for indirect branches and calls, because calls are indirect branches in my IL right now. It's just it's more convenient to just stuff them in like that. Um, and that means that at initial execution, you do need to associate a PC such that you can uniquely identify which graph to lift. But that's why I'm able to say that this is PC1 and this is PC2 and this is PC8, even though it makes no sense because the, they don't fit in those instruction boundaries. These are just unique identifiers for indirect branches at this point. So that means when I set PC equals 8, I will see in my code, in this test VM, I will see that there will be a request to lift a PC of 8. And then I emit the right IL for PC8, and then I'll eventually see a lifting request for one and two, and I'll emit the correct P, uh, I'll emit the re correct graphs for one and two, and whatever and whatever. And at that point, it's PC is just a unique identifier for lift, and lift can do anything. It can it can read the instructions and actually lift it like a real processor. It can just know that one and two are traps and whatever and whatever is an actual graph and we're gonna that's how we're gonna write this case so uh so we're gonna get rid of this and then i'm gonna add another register <laughs> so i'm gonna add a register um put it just make some space here oops Select all of these, slide these down, and then we're gonna add another register, which I which I do already have. Ah, send it back. Ah, oh, I can't like select while inside that. Kind of annoying. So we'll, that'll just drag. Maybe there's a different shape that I can. I, it's not gonna be a huge deal. Okay, this is ZMM31. I think. Let me double check. I'm pretty sure it is. Uh, ZMM31. Uh, 31. Yeah. Okay. So ZMM31 is a special register that I have hardware allocated to ZMM31 always because we're going to be using this register frequently enough that it's worth keeping in a hardware register. So I just, ZMM31 is just always part, is always this register. Uh, I haven't really named it, so I'm just gonna call it ZMM31. Um, I'll eventually maybe make a pretty name for it, but whatever. So ZMM31 contains the block label identifier of the branch that the, that the code wants to execute. Um, TLDR for every single block that I left. So, in my IL, Branch indirects and calls will look up a entire graph and it will enter the graph uh, from block zero or an edge case after a call. Um, so all of these blocks have unique labels. So in this case, in my based on my IL, and let's I think I actually added this on on one of my last streams. So, oops. We'll just drag this text here. I think I can just double click. So this is this is block zero, and this is block zero as well. Because these are called IL graphs in the way that I've architected things, right? There's always a chance that I could re-architect things, and that might be the, the path that I go down. I'm, I'm making, right now my mindset is not how do I fix this problem? It's 
how do I write the best possible code? And so what is on my mind is not looking forward into what changes I can make to my code to make it work. I'm also kind of looking backwards. I'm looking, is there anything that I can delete and rewrite in a different architected way that would make these problems not the same problems that I have? Um, and that, that makes the state explosion in my head so fucking large that I, I struggle to even think about the problem anymore because I'm not thinking about, oh yeah, I just need to add these state fields here, here, I need to fix up these instructions. I'm thinking about, sh should I be even having this problem? Because if the answer is no, then I should re-architect. I'm not, I'm not working with any, anyone else on this project, and that is the, the glorious part of working solo on dev projects, is if I want to rewrite everything and throw it in the trash, I can do that. So that is always very high up in the priority list in my head. I love rewriting code. So, um, this is not block one, this is block zero. Okay. So you'll see that based on these graphs, so these are IL graphs here. So we'll put these, um, uh, what do we wanna do? Um, I kinda wanna use a different shape. We'll use this, why not? So this is an IL graph. And this is another IL graph. And then this is a final IL graph. Honestly, I don't even I don't even fucking like that. We'll use just normal rectangles. So these are different IL graphs, and the blocks are allocated zero indexed. Um, the blocks are allocated send back control shift B. Okay, and then we'll put this down here, and this we'll grab rectangle and put it around here. This is another IL graph. Okay, so we have three different graphs. And the blocks are always zero indexed in the graphs, and that's because a lot of the graph database that I've implemented is used, uh, uses arrays internally. And if you watch my last stream where I optimize some of these, um, when I optimize some of the optimization passes that I have, uh, you saw that switching from hash maps and hash tables to indexed vectors uh, was a huge speed up. So I've designed almost everything in my graph library to be zero indexed. The registers are zero indexed, the blocks are zero indexed, everything's zero indexed. And that means that I can perform very quick lookups when I'm traversing graphs and performing optimizations, um, which is fantastic. Uh, and I'm gonna stick with that model, which means that these blocks are block zero uh, which means that I can't actually store in ZMM31 that these want to execute block zero. However, tricky, 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 um, I have a special thing that I pass into I'll graph new. Okay, so basically the logic of this code is really straightforward. Uh, if the IL cache does not have a key for the PC that we're trying to branch to, try and look up the global cache. If the global cache has a copy or turnout, if the global cache does not have it, that means that we have a lock on the global cache and no core on this entire machine has lifted this PC. So for the first time, we're lifting this PC. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a new IL graph. Here we go. I make an empty IL graph. I then pass it uh, unique label ID, uh, this is an arc to a, an atomic U size, or atomic U64, it doesn't matter. So this is the unique identifier for graph labels, which can be clothed and shared. And what this means is since I make one of these, when I create the initial uh, IL session, this is the unique identifier, it's just like some random shit at the top bits and then a bunch of zeros. Uh, that's the initial state, and then every time I go to create a, uh, an IL graph, you'll see this is actually the only spot I create an IL graph in my code, I pass in that unique IDs as a sum because I want it possible to be able to create a graph without that. So then if I look into folk IL source uh, IL graph mod, and we look at the implementation of new, we see that this takes the unique sequence, which is that RQ64, 
And if it exists, then I will put that as the unique identifier in the IL graph. And remember, the IL graph is created for every single like function, technically every single unique entry point. So in here, I end up storing that somewhere here, the unique identifier. And then I can look for references to that. Here I assign it when I create it, of course. And then down here, um, this allows me to look up a unique identifier for a label if one exists, which is what this does. It uses this uh, lookup database. And then here, when I allocate a label, so create named label, this is what I use when I have a PC associated with a, a block, which I call labels. Um, so when I go to create a block and I know a PC that's associated with that block, I will name that, and that means that there's just another database that allows me to go from the PC to the block. That's it. That's all it is. Uh, however, I use alloc label internally. So all labels are allocated. All new blocks, anonymous or not, are created through alloc label. And alloc label is going to get the next free IL label, um, which is that sequential number. I'm then going to increment it by one safely, and then I'm going to uh, insert this into the graph, and I'm going to say that this label exists. So the first time you call this, this is going to be zero. So you're going to get IL label zero, the root node. It's going to then increment that by one so that the next person to come by will get one, two, three, so on and so forth. That's how I keep them sequential. And then here, if we have provided a unique identifier arc, which we have, and in all cases, in what we're looking at, then get the do a fetch add. So atomically fetch an add from that unique label identifier to get a unique ID. And then in the unique identifier database, uh, create a mapping from the unique, uh, or actually create a mapping for the label to the unique identifier. TLDR, since I have multiple graphs, I share one 64-bit atomic variable with all the graphs that they all atomically increment and update to get a truly globally unique identifier for the graph. And that's what we have. So we do actually have that concept. We, we can uniquely identify all of the blocks. A-OK. -okay. No problem. So, uh, I actually currently support that. So if you look at folk IL source, uh, IL graph JIT, and we take a look at branch conditional, um, this, is the, this is the code that I emit on branch conditional. This is just basically setting temp kmask to things that want to take the branch. And then down here, I'm going to look up the uh, unique identifiers for these different paths. So I know... Uh, one thing that is really important is conditional branches in my IL will always be part of the graph. You can't have an, there is no um, indirect conditional branch in my IL. So all conditional branches are internal to the graph and thus they always point to a valid block in the graph or a block in the graph. So what this means is I can look up the unique identifier for the false target and the unique identifier for the true target. And then in ZMM31, for all VMs that are currently running, so everything that is running this instruction, which all of the VMs that are online, this is the K1 online K mask that we indicate, set all of these in ZMM31 to the false target identifier. So we're going to say that everyone is going to the false target. Because the way that these work, these comparisons, they're basically saying for all of the VMs that are active, perform a comparison, and if the comparison is false, then zero it out. So that means that temp kmask is actually a subset of kmask always. So kmask might be like 1111 4-bit set, and temp kmask might be 1010 at the end, but it will never have bits added on to it, right? It'll only get masked down. So I can say that all of them take the false path by default, and then, with temp kmask, I can broadcast the true target identifier. And now at this point, ZMM31, at least in this specific case of a conditional branch, ZMM31 has been updated to have the unique identifier of the blocks that they want to execute. Cool. And I can go from the block IDs to a PC.
No problem. I, I can do that. So I actually don't know if I have that database built yet, but I have all of the information that I can, I just have to make a new hash map that contains that information, but I can, I can go from a unique label to a graph to the block in that graph, which is great. And conditional branches will only be executing from the start of a block, so I don't care about the instruction index into that. So in this case, um, I don't think I set ZMM31 at the start. I think it's undefined, but I think I want to set that. Because I want to be able to run something with online, um, with not everything enabled. Mm, I would just do that through faulted VMs. Yeah, I think ZMM31 is just undefined at the start. So, there's no reason... Um, Oh, I can't paste like that. I can't click once and paste. I'll have to double click or like triple click to paste. Okay. So ZMM31 at the initial state is undefined. We don't have a, a target of where we want to go because we haven't lifted anything yet. Um, we're then going to lift this and then we'll start figuring that out. So we're going to go to that next instruction. So this is... I think this is now all of the state that I currently have. So this is going to be uh, block one, zero. So this is about, this is prior to executing this add. So whenever I talk about the, the index of like a block or a label, it's prior to execution, not after execution. So at this point, um, in my current implementation, this will happen. These will get zeroed out because they'll get masked off. If we take a look at bcond, uh, my bcond I'm pretty sure is correct. Uh, this is going to and k2, k2, k7. Um, this is going to do a permute of the following VM's target of the unique identifier of the target. So ZMM31 has the unique identifier. This instruction is basically saying, take the unique identifier of the VM we are following, in this case VM0, and broadcast it to all positions in ZMM1. So now ZMM1 contains the unique block identifier in all eight lanes that the VM that we're actually going to follow is going to take. That allows us to update the K-mask by saying uh, no K-mask for all VMs if the path that they want to take is the same as the path that we're about to go down, then we can actually bring them back online. So this is an edge case that I don't cover in the graph right now, but basically if, if something were to have diverged at some point wanting to go to block one, and then we were to eventually execute block one, we would actually turn those VMs back online. So this is basically saying like, anyone who's going to the same path that I want to go to can come along which is true because it's about to go execute the same instructions and we can execute in parallel again. So that'll actually bring VMs online. Uh, in our example, it's only gonna mask things off. In this case, the way that logic is gonna work is we're going, this online mask, there's kind of an intermediary step here while we're executing internal to the JIT. So online is still set to all ones. We have made a decision that we're gonna follow VM zero. VM0 wants to go to, uh, we're gonna give these all unique identifiers now. So send that to, send that to back. We're gonna say that this is UID1. This is UID2, UID3, UID4, and UID5. Uh, this is block zero. And we'll try and move these around a little bit. Not really need the arrow. Move that up. Okay. So zero, uh, one, two, three, four, five. Perfect. Okay, so internal to this, 
the very first thing that we're going to do in our JIT, we're going to perform the comparison. We're just going to ignore that. We're going to perform a broadcast into ZMM31, and we're going to fill it in with the false target. The false target is UID3. So temporarily, this is going to happen. We're going to write to all the online VMs. All of those are online. We're going to say that they want to branch to UID3, which is true. Uh, not in all cases. And then the very next instruction, we're using tempk mask, the ones that have matched the conditional. We're going to set those to the true target. So let's take a look. All the green ones will actually want to go to two. So we're going to then post update these to two. Cool. Then I'm going to perform a, uh, what is this doing? This is doing a and and w. This is figuring out whether or not, ah, this is the conditional. This is checking if the VM that we're following, K7, which is the VM we're following, if K7 is taking or not taking the branch is what this is doing. That's going to be used as, that's going to set a flag in the zero flag. Um, if it's non-zero, we want to go to the true target, which is in this case. So this is going to set the zero flag if the condition is true. Whatever. Don't worry about it. That's what it does. Then I'm going to do a permute quad word using no K mask uh, using a perm to ZMM1, which is fine. ZMM1 is a scratch register, so I don't have to worry about clobbering it. So temporarily, I'm not going to keep this state around forever, but temporarily I'm going to show you what happens internally. We have ZMM1. This is going to actually get the VM we're following, which is this one indicated by following VM, it's going to broadcast that to all lanes. So now this has been updated to twos. Because that is the UID of where we want to go. And then the next thing that it's going to do is it's going to do a compare of equality using no K mask into the K mask register, the online of ZMM31 to ZMM1. So what that's going to do is it's going to compare these two registers and it will set online to one for where they match. And we'll see that they match wherever it's green, which who to thunk that was the goal. So here we go. These will get disabled. And that's it. That is the last thing we're going to do before we do a conditional branch or we do a follow through to the false target. And that's it. That is our conditional branch implementation. And ZMM1 was scratched, so we can discard that. And that's correct. That was, that was accurate. Um, that also left the state in ZMM31 that ZMM31, um, there is an association left that we know that these, these VMs have not faulted, the red VMs have not faulted, thus we can bring them back online. If we want to bring them back online, we can go look in ZMM31 to determine the places that they wanted to go. And these wanted to go to three. So we could successfully execute this path and then bring these back online because we know that they need to start execution at block two uh, UID equals three, which is true, simple enough. And that was the logic behind what I implemented. Of course, that's what I expected. Um, and that works fine and dandy. That also works in the case that if something were to somehow, if like bind C were to jump back up to block zero and cause the state of A to change during that like conditional, and then we were to come to block two, it would actually bring the other ones online with it. So like, let's say this VM we were following did some like weird branch on this branch indirect, ended up setting A to six, and then ended up jumping back to PC equals eight. It would come through and execute. It would then go down this path. That comparison would be performed where it's checking the state of, of the VMs we're following. And then it would bring all of the VMs back online that were masked off. And instead of running five of them when we go to at the end, it would actually run six of them in parallel temporarily until they diverge again, which is fucking fantastic. Um, and that was the goal. And that works great. Uh, I am pretty sure that for 
uh, for conditional branches, my IL and implementation is 100% correct for all divergences, whether it's a memory access divergence or a branch divergence. No problem. Re-execution is handled uh, perfectly fine. Uh, or at least I have all of the information I need to handle it fine. I don't know if I haven't implemented yet, but I have the information to implement it. But I'm going to take a quick bio break. Does anyone see where this doesn't work? I'll be right back. All right. No ideas? Okay. That's okay. I'm still struggling with it. So, based on the logic that I have for conditional branches, I will bring back any VMs that want to branch to the same unique label, which is true. But there are a couple weird things. So, um, let's, let's just keep walking through it. Let's keep walking through it. Uh, we're going to go to block. Uh, block one UID two. OK, so we're going to execute that instruction. We're going to go. We're going to skip directly to block or instruction two. So we don't really care about the add. So we're going to skip to two. At this point, we have added eight to B. In which case, B has become, uh, only these lanes have been modified. 8, 8, 24. Uh, and then we're, we just perform a, performed a load into C. We're going to ignore C, but that's just going to get the memory at 8 for these two. So it's going to have 1 and 2 in there. Still need to update your VM pointer mask, right? Is that why it doesn't work? Not quite. So updating the, the mask is already done. OK, so this VM gets masked off. So that one got disabled because it deref 24, which was an invalid address, and that calls default. And so that got masked off. So that's another position where things are getting masked off. Now, that one's a special one, because that one gets a 1 for faulted VMs. And when a VM faults, I actually clobber ZMM31. And I put, a, I put a value in there that doesn't exist as a label. Um, and basically, that means that when I disable that VM, and I can look at that code here, um, on an MMU fault, I'm going to determine the faulting mask. And I'm going to say uh, online and equals the ones that didn't cause a VM exit. 
So we're going to mask off all the VMs that caused a VM exit, and then we're going to set that the ones that caused this VM exit, the ones that caused a fault, are faulted VMs. And then I'm going to merge into aisle 31, which is ZMM31. Uh, for cause VM exit, I'm going to splat in dead. Um, and dead is just not a value that's used for labels. And thus, I end up with dead in there, and that means I don't have to worry about if I were to go and have something pick that up, because nothing's ever going to pick up dead, because that's never going to be a true or a false target, so it's never going to turn this back online. So um, on the software side of things, on the code, si the Rust side of things, this will never get enabled because we mask off faulted VMs, so this will never get enabled there. And in the JIT side of things, this will never get set back online because it's marked dead, which means it will never match a branch. So we do actually, I'm pretty sure we handle load faults correctly. But while I think I handle them correctly, it's still part of the complexity. It, it, is, it is a way for VMs to get disabled, and it causes divergence, kind of. It doesn't cause things to start executing different things, but it causes that VM to no longer be executing along with the others, uh, which is something that is kind of important to keep in mind. Okay, so that is the state at two. And now we perform a branch indirect, and this is where it gets really difficult. So, uh, I see what's happening here. So now we are at, hmm, <laughs> and basically we're doing an indirect branch to one and two. So we have two VMs online, which is great. And if we take a look at our bind implementation, uh, what we're gonna do is we're going to uh, get the following VM, we're gonna broadcast it, we're gonna move it into a register, and then we're gonna look that up through the indirect branch table, this is going to convert a target PC address into a JIT PC address. Um, and then, so yeah, so that has internally found that we're following this VM, we're definitely going to uh, PC1, because that's the VM we're following. And then here, I am disabling VMs that are not going to that PC. So for I'm comparing the PC address with this broadcast out path that um, that the basically in this case the two the, the, or the one actually because this is the where we're branching to the one has been broadcast to all positions all lanes in ZMM zero. I'm then comparing the indirect targets with that. So anyone who is currently running. We're not going to bring old VMs online. Anyone who is currently running who wants to branch to this PC with me uh, will be enabled. So this will disable VMs. Uh, I have a note here that this will not enable VMs. I want to actually change that. Um, anyways, and then we branch that point. And uh, so let's say this is at... Uh, this is PC1. We'll say this is PC1 block 0. We now have online is equal to zero, 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 zero. That one has not faulted, it still exists. And great. So we're gonna execute this VM to completion. And then this VM is going to lift that trap instruction. This VM is going to then, uh, this is going to be the state of this VM. It is at block zero instruction one. This will actually be faulted, and this will no longer be online. Because that hit the trap instruction. And that, that's an unconditional trap here. So unconditionally, branching to PC 1 or 2 will cause a trap, which is the end of that case. And that is now faulted and marked offline. And trap is actually, if we look at how trap works, um, it's just going to return with a return code. If we look for... 47AB4000, that's going to say that all of the VMs that were online caused a fault, which will cause this trap. Then we can look at the trap handler, and this is going to say all of the VMs that caused a VM exit will get masked off, which will turn 
that VM off, and then it will or that as a faulted VM, and then it will also dead this so it doesn't come back online. So now these VMs cannot come back online with a conditional branch because they don't have valid paths. They can't be turned on because their faulted VM states have been set to one. All right. So now we're at the part that doesn't work. <laughs> kind of. I'm going to go and figure out which VM to re-execute. Now, currently, um, I actually kind of can handle this uh, for the very next step. So the next step is the PCs are unknown. Nothing is online. And when nothing is online, that means I have to... When I go through this loop, and I actually need to change this loop because I think some logic here is wrong, but I'm saying while all of the VMs, or while there is a VM that is enabled, while there is a VM that has not faulted, <laughs> then I want to look up the JIT entry address, um, which is actually incorrect in some cases, and I, I need to, uh, I'm going to make note of that because I thought about that when going to bed. Because that's also not correct in all cases. Yeah, welcome, welcome to hell, man. <laughs> welcome to hell. So, luckily, this is all just programming, plumbing, and thinking. It's none of these are unsolvable problems. This is all technically possible. It's not like we're gonna get through this and we're gonna be like, oh shit, vectorized emulation doesn't work. It does work. Um, we just have to figure out how we want to architect these things. So I'm gonna make JIT. Entry, adder, wrong, all, faulted. And I think, basically on a faulted update, I'm going to end up setting, yeah. Now, I think I have an assertion here that would trip, because it would go and enter with nothing online. And I think this would, if following VM is uh, asserted as less than eight. Yeah, no VM active. Okay. So that would actually cause, so I do have a bug right now, but I cannot hit the bug without hitting this assert. So I don't have to worry about that immediately. Um, even if I forget for half a year, uh, I know that nothing will be affected until I hit this assert, in which case it will be obvious what's happening. Okay, cool. Great. Nice. Uh, what else? Do we also have that anywhere else? Uh, retry adder is equal. Code coverage. That's fine. Code coverage will not mask anything off. And that's the only other state. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Nice. So I do have a bug there that I need to fix, but it's not a big issue. Cool. All right. So the way that logic will work is I will perform that branch. I will then come through here because I'll hit trap. Uh, trap causes a break out of the JIT, of course. We'll hit this trap. We'll be running through here. So when this state happens, we'll go through here. We will update. We'll disable the VM that caused the trap, which will just be that one in this case. We will update uh, that that VM is faulted to not bring it online, and then we will also merge in dead to cause VM exit such that it doesn't get brought back online by the JIT. Then we will, that's just a uh, reporting stuff, and then we'll loop back to the top. Uh, JIT entry address is none because it has not been set because the pre uh, because a trap does not have a return entry point into the JIT. Uh, some things do, like uh, MMU faults actually report the PC to jump back to, uh, to retry the fault, um, because there's chances that you can handle the fault depending on your fault handlers that you set up in your plugins. So that's something I have to support. So in this case, JIT entry address is none because traps don't set it. And I'm going to get all of the PC values. Now, uh, actually, if we look at trap, that's actually going to be wrong because we have an updated PC. Ah, uh, technically doesn't matter. See where our problem is? So here, um, when we loop back around, 
we are going to make a decision about what to execute based on PCs. Now, this is actually incorrect. Um, and this is the crux of the problem. Some VMs will be disabled because they faulted, whether it's a trap, whether it's a MMU fault, whether it's an instruction fetch fault, in which case those VMs will be faulted hard and they won't be able to be brought back online with the JIT because they'll be marked as dead and they'll be marked as faulted. So here, um, while I might temporarily perform a comparison, I'm going to mask off any faulted VMs and I won't bring them back online. So I don't have to worry about that. But this is where it's really difficult. And this is the crux of the problem. Some VMs in the state that we're currently in, there's one VM that wants to execute PC2. And there are other VMs that want to execute a block identifier, which is almost like you need a fault reason for each lane, yes. And that's what I'm thinking. And I think I can do it with a Boolean with another mask. Um, yeah. So what I'm, what I'm thinking is, so the online mask is always what is actively running. That's easy. But I could have another mask because I think there are only two ways that things can re-execute. Things can re-execute because... Well, things can only ever re-execute in divergence. Nothing can re-execute due to a fault. There is a small internal edge case where they can, but that's not actually part of like the outside logic loop. Um, that's not part of the decision because all of them will go to re-execute. Whatever. Anyways, I think what I need to do is I need to have a mask, and I think Booleans work, that will tell me whether or not the VM needs to re-execute from a block or from a PC. And if I had that, it would look something like this. And I think it would then be correct. Um, yoink, paste, move. Oh, if I click on one of those X's, that's what's getting me. If I click on one of the X's, so I need to be like between them. Okay. So we're going to call this like once PC. In this case, these are just unused. So it doesn't matter because they're faulted. And then in this case, we're going to have doesn't want PC, does want PC. Uh, that one's faulted off, so it doesn't matter. Um, this one doesn't want PC, and these don't either. So then what this would do is when I go back to recompute the branch targets, the, the re-execution path, I would say... Um, if the bit is set for the corresponding lane, then I would go based on the PC value. Um, in fact, I could actually maybe have ZMM31 hold the PC value. Ah, I don't like that. I might need more bits. So, yeah, this is kind of where, this is where the problem starts to settle in for me. So, there, there, basically, I need to store... Uh, this VM that got disabled, I need to store where this wants to execute. This wants to execute at PC equals 2, right? Use the top bit of the ZMM31 label. The problem is uh, this emulator is designed to support any address space, and that means that all bits are valid. So if I, if I set the top bit as indicating PC, then I couldn't jump to PC equals negative 1, right, where it's all Fs. So I could just do ZMM31 is the block label UID. Well, the problem is I need a place to store it. Uh, what about finitely recording each sub-step of the block? What do you mean by that? I'm, I'm open to anything, but... This is, this is basically the state. These things want to execute these unique block IDs. This wants to execute a PC. Um, I could add this tracker that would tell me which ones are PC and which ones aren't. Um, th 
the problem is if I overload ZMM31 and put a PC value in here, I might actually be able to do that. Um, I might be able to do that. Hmm. Because this bit would tell me whether or not that's a block ID or not. So what's important is I need to be able to encode any PC. So all 64 bits. If an edge in your graph denotes a node, you can have an indirect call to its own node ID. Um, I think I might know what you're saying. And I... I I'm, I'm going to tell you one of the ways that I can accomplish this problem. Um, and I don't know if it's what you're saying, but it, it sounds kind of close. Uh, what I can do is I can actually resolve the PC into the unique ID of the block. And then I normalize everything where everything, I don't have PCs, I only have normalized block IDs. Because each PC will correspond to... Um, it's so scrolled off now. Each PC will correspond to a block zero in some graph somewhere. Like this would be UID four and this would be UID five. And that would theoretically work. And then I would get all the benefits where I could bring those back online. And I, 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 I don't know if that's what you're saying. But yes, I could I could resolve ZMM31 to the UIDs, and then I have that done. Yeah, pretty much that. Okay, cool. Here's my problem with that. Um, the problem is these. This is JIT. <laughs> so the way this actually works is when we're executing this, when we get to this bind for the first time, these blocks don't exist yet. Um, so, what I would have to do to make that work is on every indirect branch in the JIT, which is fine, I can do it, it's, it's possible, um, I would have to go through every single branch target, request that they're lifted, and then request... Uh, and then fill them in. So instead of my branch indirect, like right now my branch indirect is relatively cheap, and it's important that my branch indirect is relatively cheap because that's currently what my calls are, um, although I can special case calls maybe a little bit. Um, actually, I can't really. Otherwise, I would have to traverse the graph entirely. So basically, branch indirects and calls allow for deferred loading of functions, if that makes sense. I won't lift until I actually observe an attempt to execute at that PC. So what I could do in here is I could go through, and this is, this is currently what I do, and it's relatively cheap. I do the perm to figure out which one I, I want to follow. I extract that value. I look up that value in the table. So this is walking the table that translates the target PC into the JIT PC. If at any point during that table walk at zero, that means that that PC has not been translated or lifted yet, in which case that'll actually cause it to go to lift request, which will cause an expensive exit out of the JIT, which will then cause um, this branch case to get hit. And this branch case will say that uh, these are the registers stored in ZMM0. So this is going to say um, that'll go up to here and it will say, I have a mask of VMs that want to go here. So this will tell me the K mask, the cause VM exit, are all the branches, and then the targets are the values that they want to branch to. So I have that. I, I, I truly have all of the information that I need. Um, at this point, what I could do is I could say, for all VMs that cause the VM exit, look up and translate their target, update their PC register, yada 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 so on and so forth um the problem there is that i would then have to resolve the pcs on an indirect branch i would have to resolve the pcs into 
Um, I would have to resolve the PCs into their uh, into their unique IDs inside of the JIT, which means that this would no longer be a scalar walk. Because what I'm doing here is I'm finding the VM that we're following. I'm scalarly extracting that one lane from the VM. And then I'm doing scalar code here, which is free. This is instantaneous, basically cheap. Um, if I... But this means that I'll only ever translate one of them, right? I'll only translate one of the uh, one of the results into the JIT address. So to do this in parallel would be much more expensive. TLDR to do this in parallel would be much more expensive. Um, basically, all of these DREFs here, we've got one. It'd be four DREFs. So this right here, this this is a we're doing four DREFs. These are each um, these DREFs are uh, let's say four cycles each because they're probably an L1 cache. Best case scenario, I don't care about worst case scenario because I, I don't care. Uh, best case scenario, they're on L1 cache. These are four cycles of latency. If I'm using um, if I do this walk in parallel. These are actually 20 cycles each. So instead of this being uh, 16 cycles to look up a branch target, it'll actually turn into uh, about 80 cycles to look up a branch target. Now, the targets for indirect branches are rarely different. So what I can do is I can do a comparison to see whether they're different first and then have a fast path where if they're all the same, then I'm fine, and then a slow path where if they differ, and that's what I do in my MMU. So in my MMU code, um, you'll see a lot of that. Basically, you'll see me doing a perm queue compare to see if they're different, and if they're different, then I go to diverge. And diverge, I'm going to do um, a parallel page table walk using VP gathers, which are like 20 plus cycles each. But in the non-divergent cat case, I actually can do a um, I can do a, a, a walk in parallel if that makes sense. I or I can do a walk using the fast loads rather than the scatter gather loads because if these addresses differ, I'm looking up different entries in the tables. So um, I think the operation to determine if there's divergence or not is relatively cheap. I think it's a couple cycles. Um, so, that leaves me with a couple things. Either A, I can increase the complexity of my branch and call to check whether or not there's divergence. If there is divergence, it will cause a page table walk in parallel, which will then cause the ZMM31 to get updated with their targets because all of them will get resolved. If, n if one of the VMs cannot have its branch target resolved, then it will break out and cause it to get updated. I would just have to change this logic quite a bit to support that, but that's possible. Uh, the fast case, it would probably be like a four cycle slowdown because I'd have to add the comparison for divergence. I think these are basically about two cycles each of latency. Um, the slow path would be about 80 cycles slower, but who cares? The slow path is going to be really slow anyways. Um, maybe. Or I can pick out, I can do what I'm doing now where I extract the VM that I'm following. I can then follow it if it's resolved, leaving the other ones temporarily unresolved while I'm following this VM. And then when I go to re-execute them, remember when, when I go to re-execute something, I when I turn a VM online, um, it's pretty much always happening in the Rust side of things, at which point in time the cost just doesn't matter because entering and exiting the VM is hundreds of cycles. So if I want to do resolving and the rust level, it's really cheap. Um, so I think those are the two possibilities. One possibility is I can always have ZMM31 be the unique ID of the block that they want to execute. And if that is the case, then ZMM31 is always coherent, 
and that also has an added benefit that I can actually bring things online if I were to have two indirect branches somehow end up at the same PC kind of at the same time. It, or whatever, you see, you see what I'm saying, like, if I have PCs different from UIDs and then a state machine that tells me whether or not the VM wants to go to a PC or if it wants to go to a UID, in that case, then I couldn't automatically bring something online um, because I wouldn't have resolved that PC. So resolving the PC is kind of looking like the winner for that regard, but I think the performance is actually better for keeping them separate because in this case, when I go to bring things online, I would first of all, I have extra K-mask registers. So I have a hardware registers that I could designate to this task. So I don't have to worry about that. Um, if I went down that path, then in the conditional branch, when I go to bring VMs online, I would make sure that I mask off anything that isn't set to going to a UID. And then that means like right here, instead of using no K-mask, this would be like, uh, actually this one. When I'm updating the K-mask, I would say like uh, UID K-mask. And then this would only cause ones that are using UIDs, which means ZMM31 is actually valid. And that would cause those to get updated. And that would work. The downside is one, it adds uh, more state machine. Two, it adds more complexity to like, some of this stuff, because when I go to figure out what I want to execute, I'm actually going to have to pick if I want to execute things based on UID or if I want to execute based on PC. Then I have to merge them together. Um, basically, I can either pay like four cycles more on every indirect branch, which are all calls, or I can pay like two to four cycles more by having an, another mask on branch conditionals. I guess I wouldn't have to have another mask. These would have to actually update those fields. Dude, I <sighs> beacons are so much more common that I don't wanna I don't wanna hurt beacon. I think I think I think yeah, Dave, I think that's the path we're gonna go. I think it's harder I think it's harder to implement in terms of the difficulty of writing the assembly for beacon that handles that divergence case is a little bit more difficult to write but it is a little bit easier on the rest of the complexity of the statement it, it's basically uh, this beacon would become a little bit more complex, but I don't care because I, I use that logic in other places and I'm familiar with it, so it's not something I'll forget. But if I have that Boolean value that tracks whether or not I want to follow a UID, uh, I feel like it's just going to be a nightmare. I feel like I'll just end up in a state where... Yeah. Yeah. I think I'm just going to resolve everything to labels. And that means I can bring things online quickly. This dead will still work as logic. I can get rid of a, another state thing that frees up a register if I ever need something passed in a register. It means I don't have to do comparisons here. So at the very start, I'll figure out the... Basically, the first time I ever run, I'll fill in ZMM31 based on the PC translation, and then I'll never use PC ever again, except for indirect branches, which will resolve to it, but that's fine. Then you could use the normal online offline thing, correct. Um, it's only branch indirects. Branch indirects calls which are identical, um, at least in my JIT. They're literally the exact same instructions. So calls, there's an optimization I can implement for calls where if the, um, if the target is constant, then I can resolve that right away. If the PC address is, is a constant value, 
rather than a register based value, then I don't have to do any of the complexity anyways, and there can't be divergence on a call. And that's the expensive case, and that means I'm only paying this cost on true indirect branches. I don't have that optimization yet, but I have the information to implement it. And that basically means I would only ever pay the cost of that quote unquote expensive indirect branch when I truly do an indirect branch. And indirect branches are only really used in VF tables heavily. And VF tables are always gonna resolve to the same address. In which case I don't actually have to worry about, um, yeah, I don't, yeah. The call, I have an optimization where if it's a direct call, I don't have to worry about it. In the other indirect case, which is basically all going to be jump tables or indirect calls, it's unlikely the user input, input influence that, in which case it's only the four cycle or six cycle penalty of checking for divergence, which is cheap. The only case where I'd pay that 60 cycle hit is if I'm doing an indirect branch to multiple different addresses at the same time, which is unbelievably rare in real software. And the upside is it dramatically decreases the state complexity. Guess I misunderstood the original problem. The original problem is when I go to execute VMs, when I go to bring VMs online, some of them might want to execute a PC value and some of them might want to execute a block ID. And currently I have no way of differentiating them. And quite frankly, I also have no way of storing a PC value. So I think I'm gonna resolve everything. I think that's gonna be the play. So I think that's gonna be the play. Well, I'm really hungry, so I think, and I've got like meetings in a bit. So I think what I'm gonna do, I, I think I understand what I'm gonna do now. Uh, I, I've talked myself out of the perf hit and trying to get creative to avoid a perf hit. The perf hit will actually be less and the code complication will be dramatically less, which will make the code easier to understand and making the code easier to understand decreases the chances of bugs. And that, that's what I want to avoid. So I'm going to go get some food. I need to get groceries too. Uh, I'm going to do my meetings and I'll probably be back streaming in like four hours and we'll just start fucking implementing. So thanks everyone for tuning in, but yeah, I'll be back relatively soon. So see y'all around.